Good evening and welcome to tonight's meeting of the Planning Commission. Um, I would like to ask uh, Mr. Pruder to explain how the public can participate in tonight's meeting. Good evening and thank you, Chair Doran. Uh, thank you, Planning Commissioners and members of the public as well for tonight's meeting regarding procedures in terms of communication. Planning Commissioners will have their webcams on for the duration of this meeting. And for those presenting on an item that is on tonight's agenda, we ask that you turn on your microphone and webcam during your presentation for your item. A member of staff will assign you keyboard and mouse controls if you are displaying a presentation. We will then kindly ask you to turn off your webcam and microphone when you are done with the presentation portion of your item, unless called upon by the chair. During the public comment period, members of the public will have an opportunity to share their comments or questions by clicking the hand icon that is on your screen, your interface for Zoom, upon which staff will introduce you and activate your microphone. Alternatively, for those who are calling uh, by phone to tonight's meeting, please press star nine on your keypad to notify staff that you have a comment. That will serve the same purpose as raising your hand. And in addition, for any members of the public who are sharing a Zoom account or a phone line with another commenter this evening for tonight's meeting, Please inform staff at the start of your public comment and staff will ensure that the other commenter who's sharing the line with you also gets an opportunity to provide their public comment after you've finished your comment. With that said, I hand it back to you, Chair Dorn. Thank you. Thank you. I'm gonna call the roll now and ask the commissioners to give a verbal response since we didn't do mic checks for everybody. Uh, Commissioner Barnes. Verbally, I am here. Thank you. <laughs> what about mentally, Commissioner Barnes? <laughs> We'll All find right. out, won't we? <laughs> you asked for that one. Commissioner DeCarty. Good evening. Thank you. Commissioner Harris. Present. Commissioner Kennedy. Here. Commissioner Riggs. Good evening and present. Commissioner Tate. Present. Okay, we are all here verbally and hopefully all mentally as well. Uh, with me, uh, we have seven members here. We're all present. We do have a quorum. We'll proceed. Uh, Mr. Parada, do you have any reports and announcements for us? So, thanks. Yes, thank you. So uh, one item of interest for the Planning Commission. So tomorrow night, the City Council will be reviewing and appointing new members to the Planning Commission. Uh, there are two seats uh, with terms ending at the end of this month. Um, and so the, the Council will be reviewing those applications, making appointments tomorrow night. And so I want to take this opportunity to thank Chair Doran for your service. I believe, and I didn't realize this until about 30 minutes ago, this is your last planning commission meeting. Um, so I want to thank you very much. And, uh, you know, if we were in person, give you a round of applause a little more <laughs> vocally, but yeah, I want to thank you. So uh, that concludes my reports and announcements. Um, and, and once again, just want to thank you for your service to the community. It's been a thank pleasure you. working with you. Thank you. Yeah, I was going to make my own report and announcement on that. Uh, this is my last meeting. I chose not to run again for another term. I've really enjoyed my time on the commission. And I've learned a lot, uh, both from my fellow commissioners and from the, the city planning staff. Um, but I've gotten a lot busier than I was when I started this. I started a, a startup and I'm a co-founder. I've got partners, investors, customers. Uh, the whole nine yards, and I've just gotten uh, really busy. I thought I was busy before, but you're not busy until your startup is, and that's kind of what I'm experiencing now, uh, but thank you. Um, so uh, the next item on the agenda is public comment. Uh, we do have the Willow Village project on uh, the agenda tonight. I know a lot of people are going to want to comment about that, but we, I'm gonna ask you to hold those comments until after we've seen the presentation on Willow Village. The public comment, this public comment is for any item which is not on our agenda. Uh, under public comment, the public may address the commission on any subject not listed on the agenda and items listed on the consent calendar. Each speaker may address the commission once under public comment for a limit of three minutes. Please clearly state your name and address or political jurisdiction in which you live. Commission cannot act on items not listed on the agenda, and therefore the Commission cannot respond to non agenda issues brought up under public comment other than to provide general information. Uh, Mr. Pruder, do we have any hands raised at this time? 
Thank you, Chair Doran. Uh, at this time, I don't see any hands raised, uh, but I'll quickly remind the audience uh, that you may press the hand icon if you'd like to provide public comment or press star nine if you're dialing in and calling by phone. Uh, if you'd like, we can wait a moment to see if there are any non-item public comments uh, for tonight, uh, or otherwise we can move forward. Yeah, I'll give them a few seconds. Um, I do want to keep the meeting moving. We've got a lot on the agenda today. No hands? Correct. I see no hands still, so you're welcome to proceed. Thank you. Okay. I'm going to close public comment and move to the next item on our agenda, the consent calendar. We have two items uh, on the consent calendar for tonight. Approval of minutes from the February 14, 2022 Planning Commission meeting and the minutes from the February 28, 2022 Planning Commission meeting. Does anyone have any uh, any changes or corrections to the minutes that would like to uh, pull those from the consent calendar? Okay, I'm not seeing any. I'd like to see if we have a motion to approve the items on the consent calendar. Commissioner uh, Kennedy has her hand raised. Uh, do I have a second? And Commissioner DeCarty seconds. Uh, so I'll call the roll. Commissioner Barnes? Yes. Ducardi? Yes. Harris? Yes. Kennedy? Yes. Uh, Riggs? Yes. Tate? Yes. And I'll vote yes as well. So the consent calendar, the minutes are approved uh, by a vote to seven to zero. <clears throat> to move next to uh, the public hearing portion of tonight's meeting. Uh, item F1 and G1 are associated uh, with a single staff report. Um, the description, uh, the title of the, uh, the item is lengthy and I've been informed by uh, our, um, by our uh, city attorney that I don't have to read the entire title ver verbatim, you know, given that it's over a page, uh, that's good news. Um, so I have an abbreviated version, which I'm gonna read to introduce item F1. Uh, and then we will go to uh, city staff for a combined uh, report. Um, one moment. So item F1 is a draft EIR public hearing for the planning commission to receive and provide comments on the analysis of the draft environmental impact report for the proposed Willow Village Master Plan Project. The proposed project is located at 1350-1390 Willow Road, 925 to 1098 Hamilton Avenue, and 1005 to 1275 Hamilton Court. And the applicant is Signature Development Group and the Peninsula Innovation Partners, LLC, on behalf of Meta Platforms, Inc. The proposed project consists of up to 1,730 dwelling units, up to 200,000 square feet of retail, 193 hotel rooms, publicly accessible open spaces and parks, and an, and an approximately 1,600,000 square feet office campus for Meta, formerly Facebook, up to 1.25 million square feet of office space with the balance, e.g space for accessory uses, including meeting and collaboration space, totaling 350,000 square feet if the office square footage is maximized in multiple buildings. This portion of the meeting is a public hearing on the draft EIR, and comments during this item should be focused on the draft EIR. Following the close of the draft EIR public hearing, the commission will hold a study session on the proposed project. More details on the proposed project and the draft EIR are in the agenda title, and the project staff report. Uh, Mr. Prada, you have a staff report on both uh, F1 and G1, and I believe you have a proposed uh, uh, agenda for us as well. Yes, thank you, Chair Doran. Members of the commission uh, staff tonight has a very brief presentation. Um, so we'll, we'll start that <clears throat> in a moment, excuse me. And let me just get this up. But in the meantime, 
one quick update uh, for the commission. Since the publication of the staff report, we have received um, approximately 14 additional items of correspondence. Uh, those have all now been attached to the agenda or previously were forwarded to uh, the commissioners. And um, hang on, here we go. And so with that, I'll move into the presentation. Mr. Prada, do you wanna share with us that your proposal for the order one one step ahead of me. Here we go. Uh, <laughs> thank you, Chair. So for, for tonight's meeting, uh, staff does have a recommended format. Uh, we do have two items on the agenda tonight for the Willow Village project. Um, it's a draft EIR public hearing and a study session. And so we'll take them as, as two items. There is one uh, comprehensive staff report that does uh, address both components, the draft EIR, as well as the study session on the project more generally. For the first part of the item tonight, draft EIR public hearing, we'll start after this brief overview by staff, a presentation uh, by the applicant on the master plan. So this is gonna be a little unique and different than other projects that the commission has seen recently with EIRs and study sessions. We're actually gonna have two applicant presentations tonight, or that's our recommendation. Uh, the first being an overview of the master plan more generally, and then during the study session, allowing the applicant team to present again on their phase one architectural control plan. So a little more detail on the buildings that uh, would follow after the entitlements um, with the uh, architectural control applications. And, and I'll explain a little bit more about that in my presentation here. Uh, following the first presentation by the applicant, uh, we do have our EIR consultant, ICF International here tonight uh, to present on the um, CEQA broadly, as well as the draft EIR and the findings of the draft EIR. Um, following that, we can move into public comments and then commissioner questions and comments on the draft EIR. We would recommend, unless they're clarifying questions, to hold them until after all public comment, um, since the questions can often lead to, to discussion and comments as well. Uh, so then following the close of the public hearing, we would move into the study session. Once again, as I mentioned earlier, an opportunity for the applicant team to present um, more details on their phase one architectural control plans, and then uh, taking public comment, and then as well as commissioner questions. And so with that, uh, I'll just do a really brief introduction. Uh, the applicant's presentation will, will go into more detail on the project components and design and the master plan, but just to, to give a little bit of context here, the project, uh, the project itself does include two, two sites, roughly. There's the main project site, uh, which is kind of the, the main master plan, the 1350 to 1390 Willow Road and the Hamilton Avenue and Hamilton Court parcels. Um, that's the former Menlo Science and Technology Park. Uh, to the west of Willow Road, there are two parcels, Hamilton Avenue, or two sites, Hamilton Avenue parcels north. That's, there's two legal parcels within that site. And then Hamilton Avenue parcel south. Those would be modified as part of the project through the realignment of Hamilton Avenue uh, to, for the access to the site. Uh, so that would include then a reconstruction in a future phase of the Chevron station on Hamilton Avenue parcel south, and then a potential for an addition of a couple thousand square feet, about 6,000, 6,700 square feet of retail on Hamilton Avenue parcel north, as well as some modifications for the elevated parks um, access point across Willow Road. And, and the applicant will talk more about the overall design of the project, but just to set the context here. And then one more slide of the existing site plan in main project site shown in red with the existing conditions uh, to the west of Willow Road in the uh, black hatched uh, is Hamilton Avenue parcel north and south, uh, the existing Chevron station, existing Bellhaven neighborhood shopping center. And then Really briefly, here's the proposed site plan. Um, just for the commission's benefit, uh, I won't re-read the, uh, the land uses that are proposed since the chair did that during the introduction. But as part of the master plan that you see here, the entitlements that are being requested include the environmental review in this form an EIR and environmental impact reports, so the certification of a final EIR as well as a general plan circulation element and zoning map amendments to modify on-site circulation for the public rights of ways and paseos through the site, um, a rezoning to allow for an X zoning district combining district, which would allow for a conditional development permit uh, to develop the site using the master planned um, provisions of the zoning ordinance. And then as well as a development agreement, a vesting tentative map, and then 
future architectural control reviews for individual buildings, as well as associated heritage tree removal permits. Um, and then the entitlements do include a below market rate housing agreement. And so tonight's meeting purpose, as I mentioned early on, we have two public meetings, uh, the environmental impact report public hearing. This is an opportunity to comment on the draft EIR uh, from members of the public and the planning commission. Following that, there will be the study session um, opportunity again for clarifying questions on the master plan, the architectural control packages associated with phase one, among other things, the below market rate housing proposal, and then the zoning ordinance modifications. Uh, these are discussed in more detail in the report as, as well as the overall site layout and design. Um, and then the applicant team's presentation will, will focus more on the master plan design as well as the architectural control packages for phase one. Uh, no actions will be taken tonight. Uh, we are in the public comment period on the draft DIR that ends on May 23rd at 5 p.m. Uh, that's Monday, May 23rd. Um, following the close of the EIR uh, public comment period, uh, staff and the city's consultant uh, will review and respond to all substantive comments in what's called the final EIR or response to comments document. Um, for the Ultimately, the planning commission in this capacity for this project is a recommending body to the city council uh, for most land use entitlements and the certification of the final EIR. Uh, the planning commission will be the acting body on the architectural control permits um, so through the conditional development permit it would set up the overall development parameters and then individual buildings would come through for future architectural controls and the planning commission would be charged with reviewing those uh, designs and so that concludes my presentation um, i'm going to turn it over to the applicant team unless there are any uh, clarifying questions of the process or meeting format uh, for staff. I think uh, uh, your your format, your order makes a lot of sense, uh, and I'm happy with it. I did want to uh, ask members of the public if they would like to comment uh, on this project to raise their hands now so we can get an idea of how many people we have. <clears throat> I'm expecting uh, Based on the email, the volume of emails we've received, I expect to have a great number of people uh, wanting to talk. And I want to make sure that we're fair to everyone and we give everyone a chance to talk. But we also have to uh, budget our time. So uh, during the applicant's presentation, if members of the public who wish to speak during the public comment period could raise their hand so we can get a, a count, that would be greatly appreciated. And with that, I'll turn it over to uh, the applicant. Good evening, this is Paul Nieto. Hopefully you <clears throat> can hear, hear me. Yes, we can hear you. Um, perfect, thank you. I'm gonna see if I can get this to uh, full screen mode. Oops, I don't wanna enter full screen mode. There we go. Um, try it here as well. This will be a lot easier for all of us to uh, see. Perfect. Let's go back up. Well, here we go. Uh, thank you, uh, uh, planning commissioners and, and members of the of the community, city staff. Um, my name is Paul Nieto. I'm with Signature Development Group, uh, and we're going to go through a presentation that um, the you the commissioners and some members of the audience um, have seen much of before. But um, for those who haven't, we're, we're going to present this because it was a, the, the integral uh, part that the, the uh, environmental impact report um, has dealt with. So if you can see uh, the, the screen, here's the existing site. And it is, um, I guess if I click on it, it, it advances. Gotcha. Uh, <laughs> The existing site is a is an uh, you know 1960s 1970s concrete tilt up site. There's really one only one access point, which is the existing Hamilton Avenue. Uh, no real connection to the neighbors to the 
uh, to the west uh, or, or even neighbors to, to the east. So there's no real access around. So it's it's somewhat limited. It's from the um, uh, the buildings that are on the site right now. You see that they're concrete tilt up. They're not sustainable. They're not um, they're not um, uh, renewable. They're not welcoming. There's there's nothing that that creates a sense of community or feel in in, in the existing uh, community. So we we uh, just wanted to step back and, and take a look at, at the timeline of, of how we got here as a, as a city and, and as a development uh, uh, sponsor. Uh, Connect Menlo started in, in 2014 and a couple of years uh, of hearings. And then, then Facebook in 2017 got some community feedback and, and made a proposal um, and, and got a lot of feedback from the community. They felt it was, uh, was it needed some improvements in terms of feeling people felt that it might have might be a bit walled off. So um, we came on with uh, with Meta in 2018, got more feedback, had a number of uh, of uh, community meetings, and revised a village a Willow Village plan. Um, and we we went through a planning commission sc scoping hearings as well as city council, and we got more community feedback on our plan. And so we revised the plan a little, um, reduced some office, and continued to get feedback um, throughout this uh, and had more community meetings. We had one-on-one -on -one meetings. Some people don't feel comfortable in, in the large meetings, so we had a number of one-on-one -on -one and small group meetings with our neighbors, particularly I mean, throughout the city, but in particular uh, in the Bellhaven uh, area. Um, and then in, in 2022, we continued our community feedback uh, we gave this planning commission presentation in January. We revised our, our plan a little bit again, and, uh, and here we are um, having released the EIR and having this session and hopefully public hearings. So with that, I just wanted to uh, recap the feedback we got through all of those meetings, and we, we grouped them. And obviously, traffic was, was, a, was a big concern, so we have incorporated some things into the plan to to try to distribute traffic and uh, and reduce that. People always said we wanted a connect, connection to Bellhaven. We, we need to feel like this is, isn't separate from us. How, how can you do that? Can you improve the jobs and housing balance? Um, and in particular, we initially started off with 1,500 units. Um, we've increased that to 1,730 units, and we, which has also increased our affordable housing. We originally proposed to do the the, a lot of the services in phase three, um, but, this, but the community said, we'd like you to deliver those things faster and can you provide us more open space? So in response to that, we've reduced the, the office capacity by 30%, thereby reducing what we had originally proposed of, of our traffic um, by increasing the housing, we get a better jobs housing balance, we're reducing the number of number of employees and, and increase the housing. Um, we've created a couple direct connections to Bellhaven, which we think is, is really neat. And we're, we're looking forward to that. And I'm, hopefully they will enjoy this community because we're trying to do something that's never been done before. We've increased the affordable housing. We've, once again, uh, as I mentioned before, we're accelerating the grocery store to phase one. Um, getting more open space, we, we, we took a, a previously planned car, parking garage and we're putting that underground so that we can have more open space and, and particularly improve the, the town square. And we've added uh, more open space in the, in, the, in the form of the elevated park and some other trails and gardens. This is kind of how we started thinking about the project. This, how can we do something that's really never been done before? Most tech campuses have been um, uh, almost uh, military bases to themselves. And, and frankly, the, the Menlo uh, Science and Technology Park was, was built along those same lines. So how can we meld uh, an, a tech campus with some really cool mixed use and residential? And we came up with the, the idea of um, centering it around a main street and a town square, and how can then we add other connections to it? So just on, on a 
on a big scale, we said, how can we get more access into Willow Road, but also diffuse traffic up to the east, the south, and maybe maybe up here. And so that, that's how the project started to form in our minds and with our design team. We, we then, um, I'm trying to advance this. There we go. And so we came up with a, with a plan like this that has divides this into into some key areas. And I don't know why the screen, there we go. I need to go back up. Um, hmm. One more up. There we go. Um, so we've got the office campus. One of the ways that um, Meta reduced the amount of people on campus is uh, creating a meeting and collaboration space. And, and this is because th the site sits in the middle of a, a number of met meta facilities. This is a way that they can gather their uh, employees together without going on surface streets. We're, we're planning a tunnel that can will handle bikes, pedestrians, and their intercompany trams that are currently on the surface. Um, so that can be useful um, and yet not add any more traffic to the site. Um, I don't know why the town square is not in a highlighted color, but it is a really key element, of, as is the, the main street and this elevated park that we'll, we'll be showing you later. It, we're mixing a hotel use and a residential use and parks in a way that, that hasn't been tried before. And we, we are hoping that you will see that this is something that can be done in a very uh, positive way to, uh, to not have a silo of, of tech people in the community, but be a place where we can gather, we can all gather together. Um, so th this is that same plan colored out. I'm getting a delay on my advancing, so, so it's, um, it's jumping two at a time at times. Um, but one other thing I wanted to point out, I pointed out in our last meeting, is in particular um, the edge along Willow Road that we spent um, a lot of attention to. Right now, I, I showed you just a single access point that was up here with Hamilton. We're proposing that we realign Hamilton and bring it right into what is our main street and our town square uh, to, to draw in our neighbors. We've created an elevated park, much like the High Line in, in uh, New York City. Also another way to, and some really cool uh, ways to get up to that park. You can ride your bike up there, you can walk, you can stroll. It will be heavily landscaped, and there will be many opportunities for for people to enjoy that park and various community things. Along Willow Road, Willow Road is is at times a little bit unfriendly because of the traffic. So we wanted to, to really provide a softer arrival experience for those coming this way from from Bell Haven. We have a we think a good arrival experience from our neighbors who are going to come across on Hamilton, but coming north. We, we want to show off a, a really nice park. We've taken a pains to really lower the architecture along the road and give a variety of building massing so that it feels warm, welcoming at a human scale that uh, is neighborly and, and uh, isn't just an abrupt change. Uh, right now across the street, Midpen is doing four story buildings and so we think this is uh, our, our design is very complementary to that um, and then of course we've uh, we've got a, a combination of office uh, on the on the east side but along Main Street in front of the offices is retail that will match the retail along Main Street and in our town square to provide a, a real continuity um, of people enjoying food and beverage, shopping, banking, whatever they need to do, um, a grocery, um, right as you enter the, the, uh, the community is a hallmark for it. And I'll describe that in a little bit more detail. The whole thing is to uh, have a, a vibrant pedestrian welcoming, you know, biking as well, uh, environment. If you notice, we have a slightly different color of road along Main Street, that will be pavers. We want to keep that very pedestrian friendly, slow down any cars that are in there so that it is truly feels like a, a village and uh, at, at that level of scale and pace. 
So we, what I'm going to do is take you a little bit on a walking tour of what we talked about placemaking. Uh, part of that is, is how people access the site, but also how they will experience it and how all of us hopefully will experience it. And these are some buildings uh, that you will actually get in more detail uh, a little bit later um, in the evening, but uh, to take you a kind of on the, on the scale of it and a little walking tour. Starting off with our um, with our market, this is coming along the Realign Hamilton, and and walking up into um, into the Willow Village towards the town square. And just a couple of things to note is uh, you know our color scheme, the orientation of the buildings, the uh, the level of the ground floor retail, and and the glass and the exposure there is is to be designed to not be uh, to be welcoming, to, to draw people in, heavily landscaped. And one thing you'll notice, if you can see the scale here of people on the street, is that we've got to raise this site about five feet to uh, plan for future sea level rise. Uh, that, that's a city ordinance. And, and so we, uh, that's why you'll see there's a gradual incline as people will, will go up Main Street. So our, our, our main grocery entrance, for pedestrians will be up here. We have an entrance off of Willow Road from the garage and another one from the other side. So you can drive up Hamilton and turn and get into the, the uh, supermarket parking, or you could uh, come off Willow or walk or ride your bike, however. But we wanted this to be a real arrival experience that was welcoming and have our neighbors feel cool and, and uh, relaxed as they're coming up the street uh, to, to do their shopping or, or go to work or how, however they're enjoying it. This is the idea of, of when we say full service grocer, it's vegetables, it's really well lit. Um, we think about that whole experience. We, we want that to feel uh, welcoming and, and um, stimulating actually, inspirational if it, uh, at times. Continuing our walk up the street, this is the corner uh, that I, I showed you before, uh, from, a, from a distance. Our next block is uh, some retail and uh, a likely have a bank here, some uh, food and beverage, some entertainment. To the left is the hotel site. And then on the, on the left, this building is a retail building in the town square that is, if you will, kitty corner to the grocery store and directly across from here. Um, providing more retail experience because we're going to take a, we're going to take a stroll into the town square right now. So this is at the corner from, you're basically looking um, from the grocery store to the uh, Northeast and uh, the hotel is on our left, a small retail pavilion with some food and beverage, perhaps a, a flower store and the like. Uh, this is a single story building, but with a little added, uh, added architecture and plantings to, to continue to create that uh, green vibrancy. And you can see the, the, the landscaping. And then the elevated park helps frame the north part of the, uh, of the town square with the uh, meta meeting and collaboration space in the background. We're, we're next going to go inside this retail building and, and see how the town square looks. Uh, as, as, oops, I went once again too far. Uh, there it is. And so this is if imagine you're you're having a uh, a sandwich, uh, coffee or something, looking out from that uh, that pavilion to the town square. There'll be a retail that you'll see in the next slide on the right. The elevated park. Key element of the elevated park will, will be able to be shown in a little bit more detail on the next slide. Is how we're getting people up to it in a variety of ways. Uh, but there's staircases and a high speed elevator. That can handle bikes and a number of people, and that's that's glass. And I hope we this just there we go. And so this is looking you're, you're looking to the east, and um, the elevated park is just to the left. And this is one of those high speed elevators that, uh, as well as the the uh, the really wide staircase to to get people up. Underneath the town square is uh, is parking, so people can easily uh, come off of Willow um, or or into uh, one of our other streets, park 
There's an elevator um, and stairs right here in that little retail pavilion or right next to the retail pavilion. There's this, and uh, this is, by, by the way, so we have retail on the front, in the back are meta office buildings. But the idea is that the, the general public will not feel excluded or, or this is to be a welcoming experience where all people mingle and, and, uh, and gather and, and do what they do every day. Um, we're gonna look up back across this uh, amazing town square to the hotel and see how it frames the town square also providing another access point to the elevated park with one of the elevators uh, with, with that transparent glass that we feel good. And then the architecture for the, the trellis and the flowers um, and the plantings continues um, to the Port Cochere for the, uh, for the hotel to, to give it that, that pretty cool lush continuity that we ho hopefully makes people feel good. Then we're going to go up to the elevated park and just give you an, uh, give everyone an idea of at least right at this section what it will likely feel feel like. So lots of trees, lots of lush planting, but a bike path. There's walking paths and with a number of what I call outdoor rooms, and we'll see that on Main Street as well, where people can gather and feel comfortable, and you can get larger groups. To or small groups, uh, or, or just individuals who wanna who wanna grab a coffee and and read a book, or most likely text on their phones. <laughs> uh, we're gonna head back to Main Street um, right now, and then walk down um, and experience that. So going back to to this diagram, and we're, this is um, our food and beverage, our um, uh, entertainment. The, the bank will likely be in this block. And here's what a plaza. Um, oh, here, oh, and here's the offerings that we, we're just trying to to get people to uh, to imagine the kind of offerings that we we may have in there and, and the feel and the, the the vibe that we're looking for. Um, and here's the plaza that it, how it could look. Uh, we, we're creating in a number of spots really wide sidewalks. Um, outdoor seating, outdoor dining um, has really become uh, a premium. We've got such great weather in um, in Menlo Park that uh, throughout the year we expect that a number of people want to enjoy that. Next slide is is really the other side of this building and plaza um, that you can see across Main Street. On the right hand side, this is retail that lines the office buildings, which we're going to go to next. But this was on the left hand side was the uh, the other side of this block and, and it's large uh, uh, plaza and wide sidewalks. This main street is particularly wide. We've kept this, the actual car lanes limited to two lanes, but we have a full dedicated bike path as well as extra wide sidewalks on both sides of the street. It's pavered if you notice that, so we wanna keep the cars um, we, we say at Signature a lot, how can we make it so that cars feel uncomfortable here to keep the keep the uh, pedestrian feel uh, to be the primary, and, and also bikes, because we have a bike path there, but, but the primary mode of, of how we want people to experience this. And you can see the proximity with the town square in the background. Next, we're gonna move to, to a more of a, um, panoramic view of what the office campus looks like from that retail plaza I just showed you out, out in front of that that, uh, that one parcel. So this is one of the main entrances to the to the Meta office campus. You'll notice the buildings are CLT timber. Uh, it gives it a real nice feel, but I also wanted to point out on the left is the retail of the town square. So the this is town square retail right here, Main Street retail. That people will continue to enjoy, and yet it's it's beautifully, uh, at least I'm a little biased, but beautiful, beautifully integrated into a, a welcoming arrival experience with these uh, with these CLT timber buildings. And CLT stands for cross laminated timber, uh, and it uh, it allows for uh, a really 
terrific, we think a, a great Northern California feel of the campus. Um, the architects in the study session will be going in a much better detail than I can show you here. Next, it, we're just gonna continue to go down Main Street to show you the, the different, different orientations and buildings. The emphasis on you know, some outdoor retail and dining, but also little rooms, once again, as I talked about on the elevated park, little gathering spots for people to, to uh, you know, hang out. There's gonna be folks riding their bikes and uh, just, just different, different um, experiences is what we're trying to, uh, opportunities for experiences, I should say, uh, that we're trying to create in this human scale. And then moving further south down Main Street, to, to the other office buildings. These, these two happen to be connected by a, a sky bridge as well for that feel. We're, we're gonna turn the corner now and get into what are the more of the residential um, areas. Well, first of all, I should, I should get that. I'm gonna tell you about sustainability. <laughs> it's uh, the, the cool thing about the CLT stuff and actually the entire campus is that all the buildings will be lead gold. We're 100% electric. Um, everywhere except for an occasional um uh, not a meta uh, restaurant but occasionally we, we're planning that if there's a, a good vibrant restaurant that needs something besides all electric cooking whether it's gas whether it's some kind of pizza ovens or things like that that the uh, the city's reach code allows the uh, flexibility for that but mostly it's all electric there'll be a, a, a significant amount of photovoltaics for energy generation. Uh, recycled water will be one of the first recycled office campus and residential uh, campuses. And we're working with West Bay to uh, make that happen. And then of course, um, throughout, it, throughout it all, we've got a real program for sustainable building materials, recycling the concrete buildings and the roadways um, and to reuse as much as possible uh, to be as uh, a green and ecologically sensitive as possible. Uh, just an example of going to CLT timber, it, the, the construction of the buildings will use much less carbon than actually the, the timber itself embodies carbon. So as, as you know, that the trees take uh, CO2 out of the air. And so um, we're, we're, we're proud of being able to do that. Now this is where um, we're going to go into the thinking that was behind our residential street overview. Um, and I'm just going to give you a, a reorient you to where I'm going to be talking about in our land plan. So the residential is on the west side of the campus in these buildings and around this community park. So from there, we, we started to look at, okay, we've got a number of buildings. How, how should we think about connections to um, to the office, to the parks, to the town square and hotel, and can we create uh, a different feel in these locations and highlight the good stuff about that and have good architecture to do that? And how, do, how will it feel at our street level? So here's one of the ideas on our center street of our, our design of the building that had all the entertainment in it. Uh, and the like is on a, a street that is heavily residential called, that we call Center Street right now in the plan to, in parts of it, step back the buildings. We got rid of a lane of traffic in our thinking so that we could widen the sidewalks, add the planting and add stoops so that you had a, a real different feel uh, in certain aspects of this development. And you'll know that you're on a, a residential street versus a you know, the, the combination of a retail street. Here's an, another side of that um, building as it comes to uh, the, uh, what we call our West Street. So you have stoops transitioning to some higher densities to, to, to get to our jobs housing balance. There are parts of that, that we needed to, to densify uh, and do it in a way that still feels good on a human scale. This is our, uh, our senior building. Um, and it's unique architecture that we like with, with balconies and, and uh, different form, as well as a, a, a really good ground floor experience for our residents 
that will give them a portico that will shelter them from the elements, um, as you can see here. And it's a real, a real nice indoor outdoor environment um, for the seniors. There will not be any, uh, unlike uh, the, the uh, example I just showed for here, we want our seniors to, to feel safe and not have any uh, ground floor residences here. They're gonna have their programming and, and activated uh, spaces on the ground floor. And then the, they'll enjoy the upstairs. Uh, on, our, on our next slide, this is just down the street across from the community park along park, what we call Park Boulevard, another street entrance that we're creating in this community. Uh, an, another vision and, and uh, expression of some ground floor stoops as well as some higher density to create a good, once again, a really friendly, warm, human scale with greenery and landscaping and sidewalks that are, that are usable. Uh, the next slide is of uh, another one of our residential building that abuts the community park and has a um, slightly varied architecture. It, it, on the left-hand side, we have another row of what we call you know, stoops along Park Street. And there'll also be ground floor residents um, that are that the park um, uh, right here. So let's, if you can sort of feel that we're, we want to create uh, great experiences that don't always, that don't all look alike and look like they may have uh, shown up over time, even though we will likely be building these pretty quickly. Lastly, I'm, I'm going to talk about um, another, and, and I'm going to end with a little discussion of trails and parks, is this is our, uh, our loop road. That's one of the uh, multi-use paths in the project. And this is on the eastern edge and the northern edge of the project. We also thought hard, long and hard about, and we've worked with uh, our neighbors at Tarleton to design this to also be another thing that's uh, a, a, a separate and distinct experience. So lushly landscaped, a uh, little bit of a meandering trail, but safe enough to ride bikes and people to walk and really um, feel like you're not really in, a, uh, in, in, in an office campus. So that's, that's the feel we're going to, for, and we want all members of the community to uh, be able to enjoy this Monday through Sunday every week. Next is our community park. It is still evolving as, uh, um, as um, a gathering spot. But in, in our community meetings, we, uh, we had a, a number of polls that were done, one of which was um, on the community park and the various activities and um, um, uses. And so this is a combination of, of those uses. People wanted areas where they could picnic, um, they could they could enjoy uh, some special landscaping, um, walking trails and the like. Um, we'll have some uh, a kids play area and gathering pavilions and things like that. This is still taking st taking shape. This is not a fully baked plan at all, but is presented here as a depiction for us to continue to refine and get feedback from the community. Uh, one thing to also point out here is you'll see a bike lane on this side. It, it's not shown on the, uh, for some reason, on the west side of Willow. But uh, working with Caltrans and the city of Menlo Park and us, we, we will be creating uh, dedicated bike lanes that run on both sides of, uh, of Willow that will ultimately lead to uh, the uh, Bayfront Parkway. We are creating a tunnel that will tie into uh, right by the uh, town square that will tie into the, uh, the tunnel that goes underneath the 84 right now for bikes to go uh, along that uh, Bayfront uh, bikeway. And I, will, I am going to conclude with uh, th this last slide that you've seen of Main Street, but the highlight here that I just wanted to talk about is this bike path. It, uh, it connects, all the way, uh, there's a spot where, where the loop road and this will can connect in the south part, and we'll continue up around the town square and 
underneath the elevated park into that tunnel to take you up to the to the bayfront and go to uh, Bidwell Park or whoever wherever you want to go as you're biking. So bikes are a key part of the plan. Wide sidewalks, the human scale is what we've been trying to achieve in this multiple use of office, hotel, town square, elevated park area to, to bring people together. Um, and that's the extent of the presentation. Thank you. Uh, I think we have a presentation by the EIR consultant next. Do I need to relinquish the control of this? Or can the, can the city take it? No, over? you do not need I don't to. See the money. Okay, great. Well, th thank you. Thank you. I think I just need to be granted control. Thank you. Um, Good evening, Chair Doran, members of the commission and members of the public. Uh, thank you for joining us tonight to discuss the Willow Village Master Plan Project Environmental Impact Report. Uh, my name is Claudia Garcia and I'm a senior environmental planner at ICF. ICF was the lead consultant for the EIR for this project. Uh, also with us here tonight is Heidi. She's the principal and project director for the project. And we also have Ollie from Hexagon, who is a lead transportation consultant. <clears throat> Our presentation tonight will provide an overview of the project, describe the environmental review process, and in uh, identify next steps for the contents of the EIR. And I think I clicked a little too fast and now we're a, a slide ahead from what I'm sharing with you today. So forgive me for that. Um, at the end of the presentation, we'll also explain how to submit public comment on the contents of the EIR. So as noted previously, the overall intent of tonight's meeting is to receive public comment on the contents of the EIR. EIR, Environmental Impact Report, specifically on the environmental impacts evaluated in the EIR and the adequacy of the document pursuant to the California Environmental Quality Act. As part of our presentation, we will provide a summary of the proposed project, conclusions in the EIR, and identify next steps. So we just heard from the project applicant who provided great detail on the vision of the overall development. This project is just meant to provide a brief overview. Um, as noted on the slide, the project would redevelop the 59 acre main project site to include housing, retail uses, office and accessory uses, a 193 room hotel, and 20 acres of open space, including eight acres of publicly, publicly accessible parks. The project also proposes to redevelop Hamilton Avenue parcels north and south to realign Hamilton Avenue, reconstruct the existing Chevron gas station, and enable up to 6,700 square feet of retail uses. Offsite transportation and utility improvements are also proposed to service the project. So for the environmental review process, as provided in the CEQA guidelines, an EIR or environmental impact report is an informational document that is intended to inform public agency decision makers, like the Planning Commission tonight, and the general public of the significant environmental effects of a project, identify possible ways to avoid or substantially lessen the significant effects, and describe reasonable alternatives to the project. 
The overall purpose of the EIR is to provide detailed information about the environmental effects that could result from implementing the proposed project. CEQA is a public disclosure statute. Um, it's also a way to examine and identify methods for mitigating any adverse impacts and, consider, and as I mentioned, consider feasible alternatives. Here on this slide, apologies for the tiny print, but it's the overall review process to date. So the notice of preparation, that's when the first document that's uh, released to notify the public, hi, we're preparing an environmental impact report. This is the project. These are the types of topics we're gonna be evaluating. Do you have any comments? Should we include anything else? And so that was out for a period of 30 days. And the city also conducted a scoping meeting and the overall purpose was to receive comments on the scope of the EIR, the content, the topics we should evaluate. Um, the draft EIR was released for a public review for a period of 45 days on April 8th. And as Kyle noted earlier, that 45 day period closes on Monday, May 23rd at 5 p.m. And today we are at the public hearing to receive comments on the contents of the EIR. The next steps in the process will be, we are grayed out here because we're not there yet and we'll discuss on a later slide. So the content of the environmental impact report, <clears throat> as noted in chapter one of the EIR and tonight's staff report, the project's location and development parameters are consistent with the Connect Menlo general plan update and was considered in the growth pattern evaluated in the Connect Menlo EIR. In accordance with CEQA, this EIR tiers from the Connect Menlo EIR. What does that mean exactly? Well, where appropriate, our environmental analysis for this project relies on the evaluation, conclusions, and mitigation measures included in that Connect Menlo EIR. However, given the scale of the project and the interest in the project, this EIR also includes project level analysis where appropriate, including disclosing um, including those adequately, adequately addressed in the Connect Menlo EIR. So consistent with the CEQA guidelines, this EIR provides a detailed project description, environmental setting, environmental impacts, including cumulative impacts, mitigation measures, and also incorporates the Connect Menlo mitigation measures uh, where appropriate. Uh, it includes alternatives to the proposed project, and it also includes variants to the proposed project. So what exactly is a variant if it's not an alternative? Well, a variant is a slightly different version of the project that could occur based upon the action or inaction of an agency other than the city or property owners outside of the project. Because the variants could increase or reduce environmental impacts, the EIR analyzes those separately at a project level. So for example, in order to construct the, no, the, the Willow Road Tunnel, uh, there, there be outside agencies that would need to permit and allow for that construction other than the city. And so for those reasons, we included the no Willow Road tunnel variant of the project, which basically means that the tunnel would not be constructed. And the, the Meta Trams would continue to use the public street network, Bayfront Expressway and Willow Road access to the proposed campus district. Another alternative we evaluated is the increased residential density alternative, which would increase the number of residential units by 200. So instead of 1730 units, we would have 1930 units. The No Hamilton Avenue realignment is exactly that. Uh, instead of realigning the Hamilton parcels, the roadway would not be realigned. It would be it would remain as is, and the, the master plan would be adjusted so that it connects perfectly to the existing roadway as it is, and those parcels would not be redeveloped. The on-site recycled water variant would provide recycled water to the main project site through on-site treatment of wastewater. So here on your screen, we have a list of all the topics that were evaluated in the EIR. This is con consistent with Appendix G of the CEQA guidelines. 
However, as shown here, we, uh, we did not evaluate impacts uh, related to agriculture and, agriculture and forestry resources, mineral resources, and wildfire. That's because those topics were scoped out as part of the, as part of the scoping period. And so we do briefly touch on those, but it was determined that these specific topics would not result in significant impacts due to the location of the project. And that information is included in the EIR. impacts and mitigation measures. As noted, the draft EIR identifies and classifies environmental impacts as potentially significant, significant, less than significant, or no impact. For each impact identified as potentially significant or significant, the EIR provides a mitigation measure or measures to reduce, eliminate, or avoid adverse impacts. If the mitigation measure would successfully reduce the impact to a less than significant less than significant level it is stated in the EIR. However, if it cannot be reduced to a less than significant level, this impact is considered significant and unavoidable. Really exciting stuff, I know. Super dry, wall of text. <laughs> so let's get into the significant and unavoidable impacts identified in this EIR. Oh, and I skipped one, so I'm gonna go back if I can. There we go. Impact Air Quality Dash One. The proposed project would conflict with or obstruct implementation of an applicable air quality plan. What does that mean? The Connect Menlo EIR determined that emissions of criteria pollutants and precursors associated with operation of new development would generate a substantial net increase in emissions. Here, the proposed project uh, determined that operations would disrupt or hinder implementation of the Bay Area Air Quality Management District's 2017 Clean Air Plan. Specifically, operation of the project would ex exceed the threshold for reactive organic gases. And that's really the threshold that we're exceeding. And so even though the project would implement uh, mitigation measure air quality 1.1 by using diesel powered equipment during construction to control construction related, related emissions and also limit the types of architectural coatings. Um, the, so a AQ 1.2 mitigation measure would require the use of super compliant architectural coatings during operation at all buildings. However, the reactive organic gas, gas emissions uh, primarily are coming or resulting from consumer products, um, which, which is difficult to control. So even though the project would require these special super compliant coatings, that threshold would still be exceeded. For noise impacts, impact 1A is related to construction noise. So as noted earlier, the Willow Road Tunnel is a component of the project and is slightly offsite and would require nighttime construction. And that would result in also excessive vibrations due to pile driving needed in order to construct the tunnel. So there are a series of mitigation measures as noted on the screen that would be implemented, including a modified mitigation measure from the Connect Menlo EIR, those impacts would still exceed the municipal code because specific to noise, the municipal code states that construction impacts should occur during the day. However, because of the nature of the tunnel and because roadways would need to be shut down, that type of construction needs to occur at night. So alternatives considered. The EIR also evaluated three alternatives in addition to the required no project alternative. Alternative one is the no Willow Road Tunnel alternative. Uh, just as it states, the Willow Road Tunnel would not be constructed as part of this alternative. 
if, if this alternative were to be selected, the total emissions from construction would decrease due to the overall decrease in construction. And so those air quality and noise impacts would be reduced. Similarly, for the base level intensity alternative, the proposed pro it would be similar to the proposed project, but developed to be consistent with the base level development standard as noted in the RMU and office zoning district. Um, so the base level alternative would reduce the amount of office and non-office um, and retail development that would be uh, included as part of the project. And the residential units would actually be reduced to 519 instead of 1730. This alternative would also reduce impacts related to air quality and noise uh, because of the reduced development pattern. For the reduced intensity alternative, uh, that would also reduce the uh, amount of office slightly um, to 1,225,000 compared to 1.6 million. And it would reduce the non-office commercial to 87, a little over 87,000 compared to 200,000 for the proposed project. And the units would only be reduced to 1530. Um, so a 200 unit difference. And that would also reduce the overall impacts, significant impacts related to air quality and noise because the overall development pattern would be reduced. And as noted in the alternative section of the EIR, um, the reduced intensity, the base level intensity alternative was found to be the environmentally superior, superior alternative. So back to our environmental review process chart, if I don't skip it. Our next steps in the process are to receive public comment tonight and through May 23rd and prepare the final EIR. So that requires us to respond to all comments received on the contents of the EIR. And following that, that document will be provided to you, the decision makers, in order to take action on the project and separately on the EIR. So how to comment on the draft EIR? Well, there are multiple ways. You can provide comment tonight by raising your hand via Zoom, as uh, Chair Doran mentioned earlier at the start of this hearing. You will be notified when it's your turn to speak. After tonight, you can submit written comments at the address provided below. This information is also included on the city's website. You can send your comment via USPS mail or via electronic mail to Kyle's uh, email as noted on the screen. And the comment period will be open until 5 p.m. on Monday, May 23rd. That concludes my presentation. Thank you for listening to all things CEQA and we're eager to, to hear your comments. Thank you. Um, so I do want to open it up to public comment uh, on the EIR now. Um, I would, as I mentioned earlier in tonight's program, uh, I'd like to get an idea of how many speakers we have. Uh, so if you're interested in speaking, please raise your hand and uh, let Mr. Pruder get a, a count of hands uh, before we proceed. Um, Mr. Pruder, how many hands do we have raised so far? Chair Doran, I have a clarifying question. This is Commissioner sure. Ducardi. Um, are you are you asking for public comment interest solely on the EIR or in both public comment periods tonight um, as you're asking that question, just to clarify? Yeah, that's a good question. Um, I suppose just on the EIR for now, because we're only taking comments on the EIR, we may have uh, separate time limits for comments on the uh, on the study session. So uh, if you're interested in commenting on the EIR, uh, please raise your hand. Um, Mr. Pruder, can you give us an idea how many speakers we have? Thank you, Chair Doran. Sure thing. We have at the moment 14 hands that are raised. Uh, that number has decreased slightly following your announcement of the EIR specific comments. Uh, so they may be related to that, but we have 14 right now. Okay. Um, that is kind of consistent with what I was expecting. There's a number of comments, large number of comments. Uh, and we are going to have a separate public comment period for the uh, study session. I'm sure there's going to be a lot of questions from the uh, commission as well. So I want to limit uh, 
the speaking time on the EIR comments to two minutes per person so we can get to everyone uh, that wants to speak on this tonight, both on this section and on the uh, study session section. So with that, uh, Mr. Pruder, if you could set the clock for, for two minutes for your speaker, uh, I would like to get started with the first one. Sure thing, Chair Dorn. Um, pardon me for uh, setting that up. We will have that up shortly. Uh, but uh, to clarify, we have at the moment now 12 attendees, uh, quick clarification. Um, so I'll begin now. Uh, first commenter I see on my screen is someone by the name of Kelly Fallon. Um, and I'm going to allow you to speak at this time. You can unmute yourself. And if you could please state your name and your uh, jurisdiction as well when you begin your comment, you have two minutes. Thank you. Hi, my name is Kelly Fallon. I'm a senior policy manager at the Bay Area Council, which is a public policy organization representing over 350 members of the Bay Area business community. And I'm calling in support of the proposed Willow Village development, which will build over 1,730 new homes, which is nearly 60% of Marlow Park's six cycle arena obligation. This project is a unique opportunity to not only build much needed housing in Menlo Park, but to also provide significant economic and community development in the city through the $75 million in amenities Facebook has committed to invest in Menlo Park and surrounding communities. And as I'm sure you know, this is far beyond what housing developers are typically able to contribute to a project, as it is an opportunity that should not be missed, on top of all the great sustainability efforts I've been mentioning tonight. So I just want to say, you know, this site is an excellent candidate for dense mixed use development directly adjacent to transit to grow the supply of housing and reduce dependence on cars. And it's a clear example of sustainable and inclusive growth for future generations. And I encourage you to support it. Thank you for your time and consideration. Thank, Thank, you. You, for your Thank you for your comment. Our next commenter um, has the name Chamber of San Mateo County. If you could please state your name and your jurisdiction, you'll have two minutes to speak starting now. You may unmute yourself. Thank you. My name is Amy Buckmaster, Chamber San Mateo County. Good evening, Chair Doran, Duran, excuse me, members of the Planning Commission. I'm the CEO of Chamber San Mateo County. Our members include over 1,500 businesses and organizations, including 60 nonprofit organizations and 40 educational institutions, representing 85,000 plus employees countywide. I'm here tonight to speak on the Willow Village EIR study session. Chamber San Mateo County Board of Directors is proud to be endorsing the Willow Village project. Silicon Valley headquarters and campuses can now expand responsibly and in a community focused way. Willow Village exemplifies this by working closely with the community and putting them at the center of the plans. Through the pandemic and the economic recover, recovery, we saw firsthand the needs of the community, especially our small first generation owned family businesses hanging on day by day. This project will help support those small businesses with recovery, future growth and entrepreneurship. It will deliver badly needed amenities and services to the Bell Haven, such as a grocery store, pharmacy services, cafes, and restaurants. And on top, local businesses will be prioritized for retail and dining. And lastly, but critical to our organization, it will deliver more than 300 affordable homes, including badly needed, very low income units for our seniors. Thank you for your time. Thank you very much. Our next speaker uh, has the name of Romain Tanya. Sorry uh, for the mispronunciation. Uh, you have two minutes to speak. If you could please provide your name and jurisdiction at the beginning of your comment. You may now unmute yourself. Thank you. Hi, good evening, commissioners. Uh, my name is uh, Roman Tanier. I'm a East Palo Alto resident. Uh, I've actually sent a more detailed email to the commission, but uh, in two minutes, I just wanted to point out a couple of uh, key points. Um, basically, with uh, Menlo Park current city ordinance prohibiting nearby overnight parking. Residents have expressed concern about increasing parking issues, speed traffic, and non-residential cut-through traffic between University, Willow, and Bay corridors, which need to be addressed in parallel with construction planning. Therefore, traffic and parking on nearby EPA Cavano neighborhood must be included in mitigation measures, and some of the impact project fees should go towards the city of East Palo Alto for safety and traffic mitigation measures, such as implementing suites traffic speed calming devices and installing digital driver speed limit trader display on Cavanaugh and Gloria, stop signs on, Cla on Clarence and Gloria, implementing an all red traffic light interval at the University Cavanaugh Notre Dame and Willow O'Brien traffic light intersections, strengthening control and enforcement of speed traffic parking regulations. Meta should consider the integration planning of a multimodal transit hub by the Santron corridors and keep pushing for the Dumbarton rail corridor to be reactivated. 
Meta should work with the SFPUC on nearby owners project to redevelop the HHC right of way and connect the proposed IV Willow on O'Brien Parks to increase park playground and green community amenities and HHC. Also, including the initial proposal for a community center on ground level near IV Willow Public Park would be greatly beneficial. Overall, we are very excited about this mixed use project with public access and amenities east of US 101 and hope groundbreaking will start soon. Thank you very much for your consideration. Thank you for your comment. Our next commenter is uh, someone named Brittany Baxter. Um, Brittany, you'll be able to unmute yourself now and if you could please provide your name and restriction as you begin your comment, you have two minutes. Thank you very much. Hello, I'm Brittany Baxter, a District 3 resident. Um, I'll comment just on the EIR portions right now. Really love how beautiful the project is. Um, <clears throat> it was great to see how there is a focus of um, pedestrian and bike infrastructure over car infrastructure. Um, and looking at you know, some of the circulation impacts in the EIR, um, really just anything that we can do to help you know, incentivize people to get out of cars and into transit or walking or biking would be extra fantastic. Um, and then I also noticed, um, like was mentioned a little bit earlier, that there is a variant available that would have 200 additional units of affordable housing um, if the project were to kind of max out its density bonus. And so I'm not quite sure exactly how that would work, but if it's possible to study those units um, tonight as well, that would be extra fantastic. Thank you so much. Thank you for your comment. We now have someone named Ali Sakurman. Um, Ali, I'm going to let you uh, unmute yourself. If you please provide your name and your jurisdiction. The start of your comment, you'll have two minutes. Thank you. Hi, uh, good evening, planning commissioners. My name is Ali Saperman, and I'm here on behalf of the Housing Action Coalition, a member supported nonprofit that advocates for creating more housing for residents of all income levels to help alleviate the Bay Area and California's housing shortage, displacement, and affordability crisis. I'm here to speak tonight in support of the Willow Village project, which the Housing Action Co Coalition enthusiastically endorsed. I've emailed the entire planning commission our formal letter of endorsement and forward you all uh, letters of support from Menlo Park residents and housing advocates. I'll now expand on three key elements on why the Willow Village project deserves your support. One, it transforms a space into a place for affordable homes. This project replaces 1970s outdated office space over 59 acres with a mixed use project that includes 1,730 homes. Approximately 18% will be subsidized affordable, which is more than 300 affordable homes. Of these, 120 homes will be reserved for seniors. Two, it creates a community of resources. Willow Village will provide community amenities and benefits such as a grocery store, pharmacy services, up to 200,000 square feet of retail space, significant public open space and a town square. Three, built using environmentally friendly practices. This project is built to be LEED Gold certification, meaning the, beating, the buildings will be equipped with 100% electric power and use recycled water, sustainable materials, and increase photovoltaics. Um, please vote tonight in support of the Willow Village project. Thank you so much. Thank you for your comment. Our next commenter is someone with the name of Jorge's S21 Ultra. I'm going to let you unmute yourself at this time. If you could please provide your name and your jurisdiction at the beginning of your comment, you have two minutes. Thank you. I apologize, Chair Doran. Um, not sure if this person's available at the moment, but I will uh, proceed with another uh, commenter if that is acceptable. Um, yes, we'll move on. Okay, we'll move on to a commenter by the name of Vince Rocha. Um, I'm going to allow you to speak at this time. If you could please unmute yourself and provide your name and jurisdiction to start your comment, you have two minutes. Thank you. Good evening, Planning Commissioners. My name is Vince Rocha. I'm the Vice President of Housing and Community Development with the Silicon Valley Leadership Group, representing over 350 of the region's largest employers and universities. 
we're calling in support of this project. Uh, our members have endorsed this project because it meets our needs for both housing, jobs, and environmental sustainability for the purposes of the EIR. It has really mitigated the traffic impacts, creating open space and shopping, not just for the folks who will live and work there, but for the surrounding communities as well, really creating an environment of live, work, play. We believe this meets or exceeds all of the environmental standards of the city. And we look forward to seeing this project come to fruition. Thank you. Thank you for your comment. Our next commenter has the name of Pam Jones. I'm going to let you uh, unmute yourself at this time. If you could please provide your name and jurisdiction at the start of your comment, you'll have two minutes. Thank you. Good evening, Housing Commissioners, Chair and Vice Chair and Staff. Pamela Jones, resident of the Belhaven neighborhood of of um, Menlo Park. Um, in regards to the EIR, um, I continually do not understand um, uh, the criteria of collecting data. The air quality, according to the report, um, is negligible. And yet, if you look at the California State Enviro Screen 4.0, it identifies Bellhaven and East Palo Alto as being significantly affected by air quality. Uh, the second piece is on the housing studies, which are done by the same um, co company that has done the general plan. So I expect them um, not to, to find anything other than uh, no impact or minimal impact. But let me give you some data on the Bellhaven neighborhood and the impact there. If the 2020 census is correct, we have lost 488 residents between 2020 and 2010. That's in the Bellhaven neighborhood alone. The high density apartments were not um, in the 2010 census because they were not built. The high density apartments have 991 residents. Uh, so consider that there's been significant impact on the residents that were living here long before Medic came to town, long before the, um, the high rise, long before the general plan. Thank you. Thank you for your comment. Our next commenter is someone with the name of Isabella Chu. Isabella, um, we're gonna let you be able to unmute yourself. If you could please provide your name and jurisdiction to start your comment. You have two minutes, thank you. Uh, good evening, uh, Planning Commission. My name is Isabella Chu. I live in Redwood City and I work in Palo Alto, so I have to bike or take a train or a bus through Menlo Park uh, every time I go to work. So housing in Menlo Park uh, and safe bike and walk infrastructure is of immediate practical interest to me. Uh, moreover, in my professional life, I, I study the interaction between land use policy and health. Uh, and when we're talking about the EIR, I think it's important to remember that the number one source of greenhouse gas emissions, air and noise pollution in cities is cars. And the, the key driver of traffic um, in the Bay Area is um, people having to live far away and commute by car into jobs. And so anything which reduces vehicle miles traveled is a powerful and important uh, uh, measure against climate change, against pollution, uh, against morbidity and mortality. Uh, cars happen to be the, uh, car crashes happen to be the number one cause of death uh, for people under the age of 22. So, so uh, vehicle miles traveled have a lot of externalities, but when we're talking about the environment, anything we can do to reduce vehicle miles traveled uh, is of central importance. And so building dense, walkable, bikeable communities near jobs is the most powerful thing we can do to reduce VMT and, and frankly give people access to opportunities. Um, so I, you know, I wanna speak in support of this project. Uh, the more you can reduce um, sort of uh, the convenience of drivers and um, provide space for uh, people on foot and bike, the better the project will be for the environment and for human health uh, and prosperity. Thank you. Thank you for your comment. Our next commenter is someone named Karen Eshoo. Um, Karen, I'm gonna let you be able to unmute yourself. If you could please provide your name and jurisdiction at the start of your comment, you'll have two minutes. Thank you. Hi, thanks for the time, I appreciate it. 
I am the head of school at Mid Peninsula High School, which is adjacent to the uh, to what will be the public park. Um, I'm also a resident of the Willows, and I wanted to come tonight and first um, applaud the city for holding this hearing, and um, and let you know how impressed we are at Mid Pen with the EIR. Um, we appreciate all the mitigation efforts. That are being made, especially because I know that obviously as construction gets started, um, we're certainly going to hear it, that's for sure. Uh, but we also know that it's worth it because of the outcome of this project. MidPen is a big supporter of the Willow Village project. And in fact, I think it's just going to do amazing things for the Bellhaven neighborhood. You've already heard that from others in the neighborhood as well. We're proud to be a neighbor of Meta. We have been, I think, you know, for obviously for quite some time now. And in particular, I am really happy to, to say that we have a wonderful relationship with the folks that are designing this project. They've been responsive to us. Uh, whenever we've had questions or suggestions, um, they've reached right out to us and have been really willing to, to talk about how this project can also benefit MidPen and, um, and make sure that our school continues to be able to thrive as it always has. So um, we are once again here to, um, to throw our support behind this project and those leading it and appreciate your time tonight. Thank you very much. Thank you for your comment. Our next commenter has the name of Ken Chan. Ken, I'm gonna let you be able to unmute yourself. If you could please provide your name and jurisdiction at the start of your comment, you'll have two minutes. Thank you. Hello, can everyone hear me? We can hear you. Oh, I'm sorry. I didn't see the nods. Um, well, hello, members of the uh, Menlo Park Planning Commission. Uh, my name is Ken Chan, and I'm an organizer with the Housing Leadership Council of San Mateo County. Uh, we work with our communities and their leaders to produce and preserve quality affordable homes, um, which is what has brought me to this moment. Um, I'd like to thank staff. I'd first like to thank staff for all their hard work in putting together the report and for their presentation tonight. Um, on, behalf of, on behalf of HLC, I'd like to express our support for, um, for the Will Village proposal under discussion tonight. Um, over 300 of these homes are proposed to be affordable with 120 set uh, at the very low and extremely low income levels for seniors. Uh, this means that as folks begin to transition into the next phase of their lives, at least 120 of uh, the city's most vulnerable senior community members will have a safe and stable place to call home. Uh, thanks so much. Thank you for your comment. Our next commenter uh, is named Adina Levin. Adina, I will uh, give you the ability to unmute yourself. Uh, please state your name and your jurisdiction at the start of your comment. You'll have two minutes. Thank you. There we go. I'm now successfully unmuted. Thank you very much. Um, my name is Adina Levin. I am a Menlo Park resident and um, I'm a part of a group from Menlo Together that um, submitted a letter to the Planning Commission and um, will do some more detailed comments probably about the EIR. And uh, first of all, wanted to um, uh, support the comments of some of the other speakers in terms of um, ha having um, uh, homes near jobs and services is something that helps reduce vehicle miles traveled and um, which is the biggest source of greenhouse gas emissions. So that is an um, overall uh, a good thing. Um, in terms of uh, more comments relating to uh, uh, transportation, um, the proposal um, uh, does have uh, uh, many uh, features that help uh, reduce uh, driving associated um, with the project and in order to maximize that, we would like to see um, a very significant attention posed um, particularly to the crossings of Willow at um, Hamilton and also Park and Ivy and O'Brien, all of the intersections that need to be optimized for pedestrian safety. Um, as well as the, um, there's great um, bicycle trails on the project, but bicycle access to the project also needs to be very safe to help people not drive. Um, with regard to the trip caps and the amount of vehicle parking, which are really correlated to how much 
uh, driving in VMT, we would like to see some analysis based on goals for mode share, what number of people are expected to be driving versus using um, other modes. Um, this is a method that Mountain View used and can help to reduce the amount of driving and vehicle miles traveled. Thank you. Thank you for your comment. Our next commenter is named Harry Bims. Um, Harry, I'm gonna let you be able to unmute yourself. If you could please provide your name and jurisdiction to start your comment, you'll have two minutes. And um, I believe, yes, sorry, the stopwatch is coming back up. You'll have two minutes, uh, please, thank you. Hello, uh, this is Harry Bims, uh, District One resident. I'm here to speak in favor of the project uh, and um, would like to say that um, this project is far from perfect as I think we've uh, seen some comments about that earlier tonight. Um, nonetheless, I think uh, given the complexity of the project that it strikes the right balance uh, in addressing the, the broad range of issues uh, that concern this project. And I would also you know, mention that this project is yet another district one project that leads the way throughout Menlo Park in terms of providing affordable housing options, uh, providing uh, high density uh, residential um, uses as well, uh, which is why District 1 has more high density housing than any other district in Menlo Park by far. So I'm speaking in favor of this project and uh, hopefully uh, this project will incentivize uh, other districts to uh, follow suit with similar projects that address the, the need for affordable housing in the Bay Area, um, and also um, deliver a project with the kind of quality materials um, and attention to detail that uh, this project uh, exemplifies. Thank you. Thank you for your comment. Our next commenter uh, is named Colin. Colin, if you could please uh, provide your name, full name and jurisdiction, I'll be having you uh, you'll be able to unmute yourself at this time. And if you could please provide those items, you'll have two minutes to speak. Thank you. Hi, Memo Park City Council. Uh, I'm a resident living in the Cavanaugh neighborhood in East Palo Alto. Meta and the Willow Village team really listened and worked with the local residents on their community feedback. The affordable housing is much needed for many low income East Palo Alto residents facing rent hikes. The retail space and prioritization of local businesses is going to open so many opportunities for many East Palo Alto and Willow businesses that started during COVID, such as the many mom and pop restaurants currently operating with much success out of East Palo Alto and Willow residential homes. Continually, East Palo Alto residents have asked for a local dog park and a full service grocery store. It was Meta and this Willow Village development that delivered on both. The community, this development will be the first in the Bay that is fully inclusive of workers and residents with an open campus that invites all members of the community to take advantage. The use of union labor is going to enrich many locals tradespeople and the lead status will help reduce environmental impact. Delaying this further will come cause harm to local residents by delaying the great benefits of this development from being realized. Thank you for your time. Thank you for your comment. Our next commenter is named Fran Dean. Uh, Fran, I'll be letting you unmute yourself. If you could please provide your name and jurisdiction to start your comment, you'll have two minutes. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, good evening, commissioners. Fran Dean, Menlo Park Chamber of Commerce. And on behalf of the Chamber of Commerce, thanks for the opportunity to comment this evening in support of the Willow Village Master Plan. Uh, the project is a model of corporate citizenship and community-based planning. The developers have truly listened to the community and delivered in response to the input. They have engaged in an open community process for over four years, public outreach unprecedented. Several substantive product mod project modifications are a direct result, including moving grocery store and other services to first phase, reducing office footprint, increasing the amount of housing, in particular affordable housing, also providing parks, trails, open space for the community, retail spaces for local business to proliferate, and, and to reiterate much needed housing. The project would not look like it does today without Willow's Village team listening to and integrating the community's feedback into the project design. 
Meta is and has always been a receptive, responsive neighbor in Menlo Park. They've invested tens of millions into the community, such as the community campus, Bellhaven Community Campus, which is under construction, support for Menlo Park small businesses, local food subsidy programs, and on and on and on. In summary, Willow Village, which is before you tonight, is a model for community-based planning delivering unprecedented community amenities and benefits to the neighborhood and to the city as a whole, while still meeting Meta's long-term goal to remain, contribute, and flourish in Menlo Park. Every project that comes forward to the Planning Commission has merit, and certainly in particular merit to the applicant. However, with Willow Village, the community is also a primary beneficiary. Thank you very much for your review, consideration this evening, and thank you to Meta and to Signature Development for a forward-thinking community-based plan. Thank you for your comment. Uh, what appears to be our final commenter um, is uh, a person by the name of Karen Grove. Karen, I'm gonna allow you to unmute yourself at this time. If you could please provide your name and jurisdiction, you'll have two minutes to speak. Thank you. Thank you. Um, I'm Karen Grove. I'm a Menlo Park resident. I serve on the Housing Commission, but I'm speaking for myself. And ironically, the first thing I'm going to talk about is circulation. Um, as a member of Menlo Together, I wanted to add to Adina's comment that um, the EIR identifies that the project will put pressure on the intersections of Willow and Bayfront and Willow and University. Um, and so we were wondering if it would be feasible to add a third entrance or exit to Bayfront from what is currently being proposed as the loop road. Um, that would create a stronger grid, um, so to speak, with multiple options to enter and exit the area and relieve pressure on the two other intersections. Um, I also wanted to comment on the, the variation of adding another 200 units, um, which is, I understand, not being proposed by the developer, but has been studied in the EIR. And we would like to propose that if those additional units get built, they be designed to be affordable for extremely low, very low, and low-income households. Um, Menlo Park has a multi-year debt to the region in terms of deeply affordable housing to meet the need of the jobs that we have added to our community. And the debt has been felt most strongly and continues to be felt most strongly in Bellhaven and East Palo Alto through eviction, homelessness, displacement, overcrowding, and extreme housing cost burden. The impacted demographic is 50% Black and Hispanic and has a median income of $50,000 to $60,000 a year. Um, in addition, Bellhaven and East Palo Alto have carried the disproportionate impact of our city's growth. Um, so that is why we would propose that if we add the extra 200 housing, houses, which is a great idea, that we meet, make them meet the needs of those most um, impacted in the nearby communities. Thank you. Thank you for your comment. Um, if I may, through the chair. Yes. Um, I believe that is all of our uh, commenters in terms of hands raised, just to clarify, but we did have uh, a member of the public who had their hand raised and is no longer raising their hand. Um, so I, I wasn't sure if we wanted to give another opportunity for them. Uh, they were unable to speak earlier when I had given them the opportunity. Sure, we can leave the public comment open for a little bit to see if they want to come back or if there are any other uh, people who wish to comment. Okay, thank you. I do see another hand raise at the moment. Someone else, um, person, uh, I, I can uh, let them speak if you'd like, Chair Dorn, sorry. Yes, please. Okay, thank you. We have uh, an additional commenter named Karen Rosenberg. Uh, Karen, I'm gonna allow you to speak. And if you could please state your full name and your jurisdiction at the beginning of your comment, you'll have two minutes to speak. Thank you. Hi, I'm so sorry. I first just wanted to clarify whether or not this was for just the EIR or if I can comment just on the Willow Village development in general. This is intended to be for the EIR, but since there's considerable overlap, uh, I'd say go ahead. 
Okay, wonderful. Hello, my name is Karen Rosenberg and I'm a Resilience Associate at Greenbelt Alliance. For those of, who, those of you who are unfamiliar with Greenbelt, we are an environmental nonprofit working to educate, advocate, and collaborate to ensure the Bay Area's lands and communities are resilient to a changing climate. We are pleased to endorse Willow Village that would bring over 1,700 homes to the city of Menlo Park. As a mixed use development, Willow Village would bring housing, jobs, neighborhood serving retail, not to mention significant open space as well as other amenities to help create an inclusive Menlo Park for all residents to enjoy. One of the many benefits of this project is that the addition of such amenities to the area would reduce the number and length of automobile retail trips for existing residents and employees. Additionally, Willow Village is located within half a mile of Facebook's major employment center with bike, pedestrian, and shuttle routes available so that employees do not have to drive. Every city in the Bay Area must play their part to increase their housing stock to make sure the local workforce can afford to live close to jobs, schools, and services. This project serves to help the city of Menlo Park make significant progress towards its regional housing needs assessment goals and allows its residents more time with family and friends and less time in traffic congestion improving the social fabric of our communities and reducing the climate damaging greenhouse gas emissions produced by driving. We urge the Planning Commission to approve Willow Village and we hope its approval will resonate with other Bay Area cities and encourage them to redouble their efforts to grow smartly. Thank you. Thank you for your comment. Uh, we do now have two additional commenters, uh, so I'll proceed. Uh, the next person is named Rick Solis. Um, Rick, I'll let you be able to unmute yourself at this time. If you could please state your full name and your jurisdiction at the start of your comment. You'll have two minutes. Thank you. Hello, can you hear me? Yes, we can. Hi, thank you. Hi, uh, my name is Rick Solis. I'm a field representative with Carpenters Local 217 uh, based in Foster City, but we represent about 2,500 members in San Mateo County. But uh, I would like to express my support for the Willow Village project, and I don't want to waste your, any further of your time with uh, explaining on how this is going to, you know, regarding how many units and how many square feet of everything. But the thing that we're happy with is the Carpenters Union has always had a great relationship with Facebook, who is now Meta, and um, are partnering with Signature Development on the construction of this project. And uh, to let you know, I mean, just the thousands of construction, and I'm not just saying regular construction jobs, but the union construction jobs that this project will generate is going to be um, a great thing for the area. So since the pandemic, there's been a big slowdown in uh, people getting back to work and a lot of uh, construction workers are suffering. But uh, like I mentioned, this is these are union jobs that provide family sustaining benefits um, for retirement, for uh, health care, uh, the wages that they will pay, and um, just everything that's going to help uh, construction workers in the area and help help build a middle class construction workforce. So um, again, I would like to urge you to please uh, move this project forward to to uh, passage. Thank you very much. Thank you. Um, I realize that it's hard to segregate comments on the EIR from comments on the project generally, but I would like to ask the remaining speaker uh, to confine their comments to the EIR. That's the, that's the portion of the agenda that we're on right now. And if they don't have comments on the EIR to save their comments for the study session. Okay, thank you, Chair Doran. Sorry uh, to clarify. We have one more commenter, um, and uh, I believe they're, they're keeping their hand up. Another one has lowered their hand, uh, so I believe they do have an EIR comment. Um, this person is named Sergio Ramirez. Um, you have, will be able to speak at this time, and if you could please provide your name and your jurisdiction to start your comment, you'll have two minutes. Thank you. Hi, um, good evening, commissioners. Thank you for the chance to speak tonight. My name is Sergio Ramirez Herrera, and I've been a Melo Park resident for the past 13 years. So I am also an eight period apprentice carpenter with Carpenters uh, Local 217. In addition, I am a job trained graduate from the training center here in Melo Park. 
my four-year career has afforded me um, the opportunity to continue to live here and allow me to work close to home and spend more time with my family. With the benefits um, I earned through my work, I'm also looking forward to a respectable retirement when the time comes. This developer has committed to using a union signatory general contractor on this project, which in uh, turn allows others in my situation to utilize these benefits and earn a livable uh, wage that they deserve. This project also includes more than 300 affordable homes, which we desperately um, opportunities to better themselves and our community. I fully support this project and look forward to seeing um, it through completion and urge you all to do the same. Thank you again for the opportunity to speak. Okay, uh, I'd like to remind the speakers that we're on the EIR report now. Uh, if we have comments on the EIR report, this is the appropriate time. Comments on the project in general should be saved uh, for the study session. Thank you, Chair Dorn. At this time, I do not see any other hands raised. Um, so uh, I think- Okay, like I'm gonna close public comment and bring the conversation back to the commission for commissioner questions and comments. Um, and I'm sure there are a lot of those from our commissioners. Well, if no one wants to speak, <laughs> Commissioner DeCarty, Vice Chair DeCarty. Uh, I'm also happy to defer to Commissioner Riggs, but uh, first of all, um, thank you. Thank you to the members of the public who've come in for your comments. They are enormously helpful and for your commitment to providing feedback. Um, overall, it's a great project. I'm really looking forward to this project coming to fruition. Um, so thank you to the team for the presentation to the staff. I thought the staff report was excellent. Um, the materials, there are a ton. I thought the staff report did a nice job walking us through. Thank you for that. And Ms. Garcia, thank you, you and your team for the EIR and for your really clear presentation. Um, I have three quick things um, in addition to um, some of the comments we've heard already from um, really well said from the public. The first one is a question. It might be for you, Ms. Garcia, from staff. Um, if we have an EIR, and I really appreciate having the EIR look at 200 additional units of housing, um, if we decided that we wanted to do 400 more units of housing, would that mean we'd have to reopen the EIR? Or um, does that not limit us as a community as this project continues? Uh, thank you, Commissioner. I think that's a great question. Um, as noted in the variance chapter of the EIR, we did have to evaluate uh, that particular variant in detail. And the, uh, Ramble, who did the air quality technical reports, did provide additional modeling information for air quality impacts. And so increasing the units from 200 or 400 would likely require additional evaluation that uh, depending on what the results would be, could be included as an errata to the EIR or an additional memo. But if it would worsen impacts, then we would have to um, think about recirculation if it gets to that point. Yes, yeah, so if I could ask the same question through the chair to Mr. Parada, just how much longer would that take um, as staff and what would that do for cost? Thank you. Uh, so, I don't have good answers for either of those on the fly this evening. Um, we, we certainly would have to look into uh, <clears throat> the cost more, uh, you know, in terms of what the scope and budget would be to modify um, the EIR and whether or not it's a, a errata in the final EIR where there potentially doesn't need to be recirculation versus recirculation of the draft EIR. So when you're asking about the schedule, um, you know, the final IR could potentially be accommodated within the overall project schedule. Recirculation would require recirculating the draft EIR for a new 45 day minimum public comment period. Um, either way, you're looking at additional time for the analysis, uh, not factoring in items like whether or not it needs to be recirculated. So I just don't have a good answer right now. I do see our, our city attorney here to maybe bail me out a little bit. 
Hi, I'm Anna Shimko and Kyle, you don't need bailing out. Yeah, I think you said it absolutely correctly. And you're right, it depends on the outcome. If we did have to recirculate the EIR, of course we would have not only the 45 day review period, but the time to respond to comments on that recirculated EIR. Great, thank you to each of you. Uh, in that case, I just applaud the, at least the addition of the 200 units in that mix. Um, and I think it's good for everybody to know if we wanted to go higher, what those impacts might be. So thank you. Um, my second one, I hope is simple, which is the, um, you know, the potential EIR and the impacts of the diesel generator for emergency energy use. Uh, this is more just a request to the applicant. You all, I think, did a fabulous job in finding an alternative to a diesel generator at the community center and would really support and love finding that alternative in this instance. So we don't have to have diesel generator as backup. It's not an extraordinary um, greenhouse gas emissions problem, um, but it seems a real shame for a project that you're rightly touting for the other environmental and climate benefits to have that pimple on it. So that's the second comment. Uh, and then the third one is actually, um, I, I have some questions around and this is to the great points that were raised by numerous uh, commenters, um, including Mr. Tenier, um, Ms. Jones, Ms. Chu, and others around air quality and transportation. So you mentioned, Ms. Garcia, in your presentation that the um, uh, reactive organic gases are essentially, uh, there's nothing we can do about it. There's no mitigation. So I think, uh, reactive organic gases are non-methane hydrocarbons. So what are the consumer products we're talking about that, that nobody has any control over? Um, that's a great question. And I can do my part and find that specific list of consumer products, but I, I don't have it off the top of my head at the moment. Um, Heidi, do you open? Yeah, I can I can uh, try to respond to that. This is uh, Heidi Meckelson from ICF. I'm the principal in charge for the project. Um, consumer projects are or consumer products are stationary source emissions, so um, not to be cheeky, but Axe body spray, you know, would be an example. Um, spray paint, um, anything that consumers are uh, using on a daily basis that emit um, reactive organic gases. Uh, this particular threshold from the air quality management district, which is a pounds per day threshold, um, is typically exceeded by large projects. It's just a difficult one to um, be under if your project is of a certain size. And moreover, because it is related to um, the actions of future project users, it's a difficult one to mitigate because you can only do so much uh, to curb people from using aerosols, for example. Okay, so those are, yeah, um, those are, I, my question is, so there's nothing related to transportation or to traffic or to parking or to automobile use, or do those um, reactive organic gases actually end up intermingling with other stuff and that's what gives you the air quality problems like ground level ozone and that kind of thing. I'm not a scientist, so I'm not trying to. I'm not trying to catch anybody out here. I truly am interested in this moment, trying to figure that out. Yeah, yeah, no, that's a really good question. Um, we looked at all of those things in the analysis. So there are different criteria air pollutants that are measured in the analysis, including particulate matter, um, NOx, which NOx is primarily due to um, that's nitrogen oxides. Those are primarily related to vehicle traffic. ROG, um, and ozone, and uh, methane for the greenhouse gas analysis. So each of those pollutants um, comes primarily from a different source, but we look at stationary sources and we look at mobile source emissions. And for the criteria air pollutant operational impact, the threshold that is being tripped, there's definitely you know impacts happening from all of these different emission sources, but the one that is tripping the threshold established by the Air Quality Management District is the consumer products. Perfect, thank you. Um, so my, with that understanding, my question gets specifically to the alternatives proposed um, and the traffic and air quality issues in that mix. Um, and so um, can, I believe what you are looking at is a threshold that is around 6,000 trips 
car trips ends up being what you were looking at for needing to avoid going over that level. Can you just remind us why, why 6,000 car trips? What's magic about that? That one, I will have to take a look at, um, or perhaps Ollie can weigh in on that one. The 6,000 car trip threshold not ringing a bell for me at the moment. I think Mr. Prada came on. He's kind of used to me on this. I'll, I'll defer to to Ollie from Hexagon, the transportation subconsultant uh, under ICF, um, and then happy to follow up. But I think Ollie has it. Uh, hi, this is Ollie Joe from Hexagon Transportation Consultants. Uh, with Chair Dicardi, um, we uh, in terms of uh, transportation mitigation, we're talking about. Uh, requiring the project to do uh, TDM reductions, and those are expressed in percentages. Uh, I'm not, sh uh, you know, I haven't done the calculation myself, and you know, maybe you're right that that's what you put it to the six thousand trips um, limit. Um, I do not recall um, citing specifically anything about six thousand, but you know, if you find it in the ER, maybe if you could point me to that, that would be great. But um, the project is required to do TDM mitigations to uh, reduce its residential VMT impact. Um, and, um, you know, it's 32% off of ITE trip generation, uh, 32 or 36% off of, of the ITE trip generation rates. Yeah, you're honest. It's, it's, it's the mitigation factor um, that I think you all identified as mitigation TRA2. And you just said it was the equivalent of 6,000 trips. So um, that, that's what I was referring to. So I appreciate the answer on that. So um, what, I'm, what I'm wrestling with is that we have a request that we're gonna look at later on this evening from the applicant to actually ease the transportation demand management. But I believe the only mitigation that we really have is transportation demand management. And so, how are we supposed to, as a community, as the planning commission, as the city council and as residents understand these different impacts? Um, it is hard for me to wrestle with what you all have in the EIR and these impacts off of what is the current transportation demand management, um, I guess, regime or expectation off of what is the requested variance and how are we supposed to understand that and the uh, potential air quality impacts and other environmental impacts? And I, I, whoever can best answer that. So through the, through the chair, if I can start from a staff perspective uh, and then we can turn it over to um, another expert uh, on the, the meeting tonight. For the environmental impact report, uh, we did study the applicants requested um, adjustment to the city's standard practice uh, for the transportation demand management. Uh, so our ordinance does include a requirement of 20% reduction in, for TDM, transportation demand management, in terms of trips. We have historically taken that off of the net trips after factoring into account um, the project site's land uses, uh, mixture of land uses, complementary land uses in the vicinity of the project. Uh, does that include some internalization for trips, um, pass through capture trips that would have passed the site already? Um, the applicant's request uh, through the conditional development permit is to take that number off the gross trips. And so that was factored in to the analysis. So what, what the planning commission and the community is reviewing um, in the EIR is based on the applicant's request. So, so there isn't a change from the analysis in the EIR to the applicant's request, but there is a there is a component of the project that includes that change from net trips to gross trips, um, factoring into account this this project's uh, significant uh, internalization compared to other more standalone uses. Yeah, super helpful. That's that's exactly what I wanted to know. So I appreciate that. Um, so I, I'll just say that for me. Um, I was really uh, appreciated the alternatives. Um, I get frustrated with the IRs that don't give a reasonable set so that it gives some sunshine for the community to be able to see the differences. Um, but there is not one that has a massive reduction in parking and the potential opportunities on the massive re reduction in parking. I, I just simply think we have to look at the, that at all these projects. Um, I, I won't certify it as adequate without that. 
I realize I'm only one vote, so it doesn't particularly matter, but that's why I think it's that important. I think it's that important so that our community has sunshine in this. Half of the comments we just had were related to circulation and traffic in some dimension. Uh, and without getting the incentive to actually build on the incredible work that, that Meta has led on TDM um, and to keep on pressing. And I really appreciated the comment in the presentation um, that Mr. Nieto made about, you know, we're, we're trying to send the incentives to have fewer cars, you said, or something like that. I think that's terrific. But the only incentives to do that is either to get rid of parking or else to increase the costs. And we need to more honestly look at that. And I wish that that was included in the IR. Um, so thanks. Those are my comments on the IR this evening. Thank you, <clears throat> Commissioner Riggs. Yes, thank you. And thank you to my fellow commissioner for um, raising those four points. Um, <clears throat> I, um, I would like to ask uh, a question similar to Mr. Ducardi's first question. And that has to do with um, if we had an alternative uh, project, um, which we don't because we scoped this in 2019, I think before we um, started pressing more firmly for it. Uh, if we had an alternative that involved a reduced parking option, both for residential and for office, would this require um, a revisit to the EIR? And uh, I have a similar question um, uh, to follow that. Uh, thank you, Commissioner Riggs. Uh, I think that's an excellent question. Um, primarily, the alternatives to the proposed project are identified and put forth in order to identify ways to reduce the significant impacts identified in the EIR. It, as noted in our presentation, the significant and avoidable impacts were related to air quality and noise. Um, Parking, unfortunately, is no longer considered a, an impact under CEQA. So uh, for those reasons, it wasn't identified as significant. And I'll, in connection to that, that's one of the reasons why we didn't evaluate an alternative to the project that would reduce the parking. Uh, understood. Um, but I raised parking as an indicator of VMT because frankly, if you don't have a parking space when you go to work, then you don't drive as anyone in San Francisco or Manhattan can tell you. So um, under those conditions, I realized that this is presumably in the positive direction, um, but does it in any way affect the EIR if, for example, Meta decided um, during the process of the building permit uh, two years from now, um, maybe they're going to reduce the scope of their parking structures. Um, would this in any way um, um, have any sort of kickback to the EIR or because it would logically reduce VMT, would this be a non-issue? Um, thank you. Heidi, you correct me if I'm wrong, but um an overall reduction or a reduction in the type of development that was evaluated in the EIR uh, would, um, for the most part, reduce the overall significant impacts that were identified. So it's unlikely that by reducing the number of parking spaces included in the parking garages that it would require recir recirculation of the EIR or identify additional significant impacts that were not identified previously. Right, and just to piggyback, you. if you don't mind, on um, what Claudia has said, I, I want to make sure you know that we did know that this would be an area of concern, and we seriously discussed whether it made sense to build into the alternatives analysis an option that had less parking. And maybe Ollie is the best to opine on this topic, but because the transportation impacts are judged on the basis of vehicle miles traveled. And there's no correlation in my understanding between forecasting the vehicle miles traveled associated with the project and the parking that's provided. We would have no um, basis at this point to conclude 
that providing less parking really would reduce the vehicle miles traveled. I mean, I understand your argument and it may be correct, but based on the way that the technical analyses are accomplished, parking just doesn't figure into that calculus. So we concluded that it did not make sense at this point to include reduced parking ratios into one of the alternatives. I believe that we do have a mention of that in the alternatives analysis at some point. But like Claudia said, if, if down the road, so to speak, the applicant decided that less parking was needed, I'm confident that that could be accommodated and I don't see that there would be additional CEQA impacts as a result of that. Ollie, do you wanna say something? Yeah, I just want to concur, Anna, um, that um, I, it's highly unlikely that, you know, additional EIR environmental review will be needed. Uh, a reduction in parking will only be able to be captured in the VMT analysis if it is tied to uh, an increase in the TDM measures effect or a reduction in the trip cap that is being proposed uh, by the project. So, um, you know, if it can be tied that way, then it will only lead to a reduction in the VMT impacts, not an increase. All right, that makes sense. And I appreciate all of your comments. So the next question is perhaps a little more challenging. If there were an additional connection between this campus and the expressway, um, a short connection between the North Loop Road, for example, and the expressway, would, uh, I, I expect that would alter the uh, city's uh, request for um, studies of, um, of level of service impact at the least, although it may improve it and that would certainly be the goal. Is an, uh, would an alteration to the traffic pattern require uh, any uh, revisit under CEQA? Or is that similarly a uh, small enough item and a potentially positive item that uh, we wouldn't need to, that it would not complicate the, the process? Um, that would depend on the type of alteration. If it's just restriping lanes, um, adding bike ped, things like that. It would that. be a connection. It would, it it would, would be, be an like, actual- Call it a driveway. Yeah, yeah um, that, that may require additional study. Um, I'm not sure that it would rise to the level of identifying an additional significant impact, but it would be something that we would need to look at in terms of air quality in addition to transportation, circulation, because it would, it would require ground disturbing activity. And that's really what we're interested in, what we're, the project, how it's modifying the existing conditions around. And so we would, we would need to take a look at that. I also want to uh, add on that in terms of VMT, which is the transportation uh, CEQA threshold, um, mm -hmm. I believe it will have a you know negligible effect on vehicle miles traveled because it's you know it's not looking at um, opening a new connection would you know lead to very minor changes in trip length. However, um, I do want to say that because this will be a new transportation facility under CEQA, I believe um, this would also qualify as the transportation project, which would require its own um, CEQA clearance um, because you're building new roadway onto um, the existing roadway network. Um, but, you know, Claudia or Heidi, feel free to correct me on that. Could this be handled as a modification of the existing one uh, or do we actually have to open a new file? Is that your implication, a new, a, a new file, Mr. Zhu? I'm not sure exactly how this should be handled from a SQL perspective. Um, you know, maybe if Heidi's- part of the, Oh, sorry, Ali. Uh, if it's part of the project, then it can be included as a project, as a component of the project, as other roadway facility improvements are already included as part of this project. It might require permits from other agencies like Caltrans. Um, but an oh, yes. additional roadway or driveway, you know, could be theoretically added to this project and not be a separate project under CEQA. Um, what we would need to look at would be potential construction 
changes to construction air quality and noise impacts, as Claudia mentioned, um, and also any potential um, changes to roadway hazards and safety. That is still something that we need to look at under CEQA, um, under uh, transportation impacts. Um, so, you know, we would want to make sure that the driveway is located in an area that is safe and is not related, not resulting in conflicts with pedestrians or bicycles or things like that. So it really That's depends right. on what the proposal is and what types of impacts it might result in. If it results in new LOS impacts, that's not a trigger for recirculation under CEQA, but we would still need to look at these other things. Um, and depending on what the change and the impact is, it's you know something that could be added to the final EIR without recirculating, or if it results in new impacts or impacts of increased severity or you know is, is large enough to be considered substantial new information to the public then that could trigger recirculation pardon me for pushing back a little bit here but if it's uh designed according to transportation standards you're telling me that CEQA would want to re-examine it based as a safety issue even if it's designed based on transportation standards it's uh, something that we have to look that? at. It's something that we have to look at no matter what. If it's designed according to standards, then that's a good case that there's a less than significant safety impact. But it's definitely something that we need to take a look at. All right. Thank you very much. That's my questions. Thank you. Other commissioners? Commissioner Harris. Commissioner or Chair Doran, I think you called on me before my hand was even up, so it's pretty good. You were in the top left position, so <laughs> I could read your mind. Okay. Um, I really um, applaud both um, my fellow commissioners on discussing how we might take a look at a massive reduction in parking. Um, and as we look at this in terms of reducing BMT, um, it's hard for me to understand that those two things are not connected. So, um, but I do like the answer that if later an overall reduction in parking should not trigger a recirculation of the EIR. Um, a couple of things were brought up by some of our um, residents. We're talking about a different way to look at um, uh, trip caps. Um, and I noticed that the analysis is always done based on the ITE methodology, which is, I, my understanding is assumed to be extremely car-centric suburban area, which this is not. And we're supposed to be a live, work, play development with a large senior population. So it seems trips should be severely curtailed, uh, both for office and residential. So, and I was just surprised at how large they were. Now I see that it's partly because we're looking at the gross um, versus the net and only taking a reduction of 20%. So if you take a pretty high average of trips and then you reduce it by 20%, you're still kind of at a pretty high um, for what I think we're trying to, to accomplish here. And I'm just wondering, Ms. Levin talked about doing, looking at this in mode share, modal, modal share, and I'm just wondering why we don't utilize um, that analysis versus looking um, versus the way we do it with the trip caps and looking at the ITE. Would, I'm not sure who could answer that question best. Yeah, I can answer that question. Um, ITE trip generation is traditionally how, you know, us transportation engineers are, uh, it's the best resource that we have to estimate trip generation for any type of, you know, specific project. Um, the mode share for, for Meta uh, relates, you know, would only relate to the the meta portion of the trip generation, and I believe that is somewhat captured by the trip cap that they're proposing um, for their uh, for their meta land use specifically. Uh, for other uses, um, you know, we we can do it that way. Um, we it will be based on very shaky grounds. Uh, we have to make several other assumptions in terms of, you know, vehicle uh, occupancy, auto ownership, um, you know, trip rates per, on, a, on a person level. Um, so, you know, it will be a completely uh, new study. And I just want to say that IT trip generation is, uh, you know, the, the best resource that transportation engineers have in terms of modeling uh, trip generation. Okay, thank you. 
Um, I like some of our residents, I'm having trouble deciding which um, which items are purely EIR and which items have to do with um, the general project. So um, I think I actually, I guess one more thing in this reducing of BMT, um, I'd like to thank uh, Ms. Chu for her comment and reminding us that the number one source of pollution is and air quality is cars. So to the extent that we can reduce them, um, I'd like to thank um, Meta and Signature for all of the separated bike lanes and wide walkways and walking trails within the village. But also as Ms. Levin mentioned, it's just difficult to get to the village. So I'm interested in, in seeing how, if we can work a little harder on the TBM and we can also work on some of these intersections, which um, are pretty concerning. And um, also on a circulation issue, again, I would really urge that this project go to Complete Streets Commission. They're really equipped at helping us try to, um, you know, improve some of these um, these areas so that it's, you know, so that it's a good place for the, the surrounding community who is going to be the most impacted. So I think those are all my questions and comments for now on the EIR. Thanks. Thank you. Um, I believe, uh, Commissioner Tate, uh, you have your hand raised. I do. Thank you, Chair Doran. Um, so I'm not sure whether, but I believe uh, that um, um, putting a new road in uh, would fall under this section and not the, uh, the study session. Um, and I, I really would like to see that evaluated in putting in a new road to take out to Bayfront Expressway. I think that um, that would take a lot of the burden off of Willow Road and University and um, just improve circulation as a whole with getting out of the Willow Village community. Um, so what does it take for that to really be evaluated at this point? I know someone in the public mentioned it, uh, a public commenter, and, um, and I actually have mentioned this before in just other meetings, just in conversation and with Charlton, actually, when his project was up and hoping that maybe there can be some sort of a collaboration between uh, the two major landowners or the two only landowners, I should say, um, within that park, uh, uh, that area over there, to um, to study this and to actually put in a road that would relieve, again, the pressure. And I know that it does consist of working with other agencies, but I'm sure that there is some sort of way to, um, to make it happen because I know that there's already relationship forming with Caltrans. And, um, and of course, relationship with the cit two cities. So um, is that something that we can um, make sure that it happens to at least study it? That's a, that's a question. Thank you, Sherry Tate. I'm not sure I'm, I'm I don't wanna speak out of turn, but as the EIR consultant, um, we're tasked to impartially review the project as proposed. And so if if there if the applicant or the city uh, wants to modify the, the plan to include another intersection, we're happy to evaluate it in the document, um, but we can't propose that alteration. Okay, so, so um, then this goes on record as a comment and, um, and a request then. Mr. Tate, did you have any other questions or comments? No, no, I'm done. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Do we have anyone else that would like to speak? Okay, I'm not seeing anything else from the commission. Um, so I will, well, I guess I should ask uh, Mr. Prada before I close this matter. Uh, do you have the input you need on the EIR? Uh, thank you, Chair Duran. Uh, yes, the, this is, thank you for the discussion this evening, the comments. Um, I 
I believe we have everything we need. If there are no further uh, commissioner comments or questions, we can certainly close the draft ER public hearing and move on to the study session. Okay, so I will close the public hearing portion of tonight's meeting now. Uh, move to the next item on our agenda, which is a study session um, on the same project. Item uh, G1, uh, once again, I've been told that it's not necessary to read the entire title of the item, which runs to about a page. Um, so I will just read the beginning of it. This is a study session by Signature Development Group of Peninsula Innovation Partners, LLC, on behalf of Meta, Meta Platforms, Inc., formerly Facebook Inc. At 1350 to 1390 Willow Road, 925 to 1098 Hamilton Avenue, and 1005 to 1275 Hamilton Court, referred to as the Willow, Willow Village Master Plan. This is a request for a study session for a master plan to comprehensively redevelop an approximately 59 acre existing industrial research and development R&D and warehousing campus referred to as the main project site. I'll refer everyone to the agenda for the balance of the title. Um, so I understand that uh, staff, uh, Mr. Prado would like to do an introduction to the study session. Uh, yes, thank you. Uh, I don't have a formal presentation for the study session. We will... Um, allow the applicant to present on some of the more detailed architectural plans um, for their phase one uh, phase of the project, as I mentioned in my earlier presentation. Um, but just to kind of set the stage a little bit, this is a study session item now. So this is an opportunity for uh, the applicant to present their project to the commission, for the commission to learn more about the project and the community at large to learn more about the project and receive the presentation. Um, on more detailed design plans for the individual buildings from phase one. Um, certainly the commission can answer questions, uh, clarifying questions, um, discuss uh, the master plan in general and the more detailed uh, architectural design plans that the applicant will present. Um, and so with that, I'll turn it over to the applicant team. Before we do that, I would like to remind the public, we will have uh, an opportunity for public comment on this portion of the agenda as well. So uh, if you would like to comment on uh, you know, the, the application on the study session, uh, please raise your hands uh, now so we can get a head count uh, when the applicant is done with their presentation. Thank you. And through the chair, if I could just add one more thing that I, I should have clarified. This, this is really meant to be an opportunity for uh, clarifying questions, learn more about the project, identify any additional information that the commission may be need for future reviews. This is this is preliminary. Um, you know, the, the, app, the commission should refrain from making you know uh, definitive statements on any items uh, this evening, and just use this as an opportunity to ask clarifying questions for the most part. Um, and, and once again, no actions are being taken. So just to, to reiterate that from the earlier presentation that staff provided. Okay, good evening. I hope you all can hear me. My name is Aaron Ashley. Um, I'm, I'm an architect uh, with Hart Howerton in San Francisco. And um, I've, I've gotten a chance to meet some of you over the last few years um, through the work on the community center and just being a part of the Willow Village project. Um, just going to try to get control here of the screen. Um, so, uh, you know, in addition to being the planner of this project, our firm's also acting as the architect of, of parcel three, one of the parcels in the middle of the project I'll talk about tonight as well as um, landscape architect of the public realm. So we've really kind of had a chance to see every angle of this, hear a ton of the great feedback from the community um, and really just start to under, really understand kind of everything going on. Um, and uh, it's been a very uh, dynamic but fun process because this is such an interesting, unique thing that we're all working on. So, you know, you've heard a lot tonight about really the challenges that come with any big mixed use project. You know, these are very big complex things as you've no doubt understand and, and uh, they, don't, they don't just slip into place, right? There's a, just a ton of work 
um, Kyle and the staff have just done uh, just an incredible job helping to kind of shepherd this along. And so this is actually a fun part for me. Um, I was going to sort of briefly set the stage uh, and then introduce Tony Marchese, architect with Picard Chilton. He's in New Haven. It's 1230 at night. Um, and then Jaron Lubin of Softy Architects is in Boston, where it's also 1230. They want to share a, a couple different aspects of the project with you as well. And, and the idea tonight was to, uh, to really kind of give you the, um, the vertical uh, sorry, I'm getting used to my buttons here. It, you know, so you, you've no doubt seen this master plan dozens of times. Um, I'm sure it's ingrained in your mind. You know, for us, this is such an interesting thing. There's not a, um, there certainly is not a prototype for uh, global, globally significant organization wants to build a mixed use campus. How, do, how does one do it? And you don't just pull it off the shelf. This has been a multi-year process of learning about Facebook, now Meta, learning about the community, learning about how all of these things come together and really sort of, uh, you know, starting with a plan uh, as a master planner, as you know, through the mind of a landscape architect, bringing in really significant uh, and talented architecture teams and then letting the plan be flexible enough to react to not only the great ideas we get from the community, but then the individual ideas from some of the architects. And so, this is very much a three-dimensional master plan, um, which to us is just so much richer and more interesting. Um, so the way we've organized uh, tonight's session is sort of threefold. There's, there's this open space chassis that Paul talked about. And if you joined our community meeting uh, in the past, you've heard about where um, the town square is this really terrific public space that the hotel, the elevated park, um, what's called the MCS and the office buildings all sort of hinge around. Um, and so uh, Jaron, both Jaron and Tony will talk about how this town square is really sort of at the heart of all of these different um, land uses coming together in a really interesting and exciting way and how all the buildings really frame that. Uh, Main Street is this, you know, super interesting Everyone seems to have a different example from their travels of, of what this kind of street is, but really it's this kind of great um, retail street or high street and how the office buildings and the mixed use residential buildings interrelate across it. And so um, in different ways, Tony and Jaron and myself will each talk about them. And then the community park and the neighborhood streets, they're really what give this, this neighborhood its sort of fabric and its life. And so I was gonna go into a little bit more detail about how the architecture of these buildings really reinforces and gives life to these, this, this part of the plan. Um, so just sort of set the stage briefly. Um, I mentioned Town Square and, you know, this is, this is kind of fun, right? There's a number of architects from uh, different perspectives all working around a public space. And so like any real public space, you know, pick your favorite place you go on vacation. You've got uh, not just uh, a sort of one, one look, one feel on four sides of it. You've got uh, an interesting retail building with ground floor restaurants. You've got a really dynamic hotel with these tiered gardens. This, you know, just like uh, super interesting um, mass timber buildings framing one side and the way they step back. And then, you know, the, this what'll quickly become like the living room of the neighborhood in the grocery store. And so, um, I think you'll piece together the character of this place and how the buildings really give life to these open spaces over the course of the presentation tonight. Same with Main Street. I mean, it's fun for us to, uh, to be architects and landscape architects at what we call Parcel 3 and to work across the street and, and, and sort of in conjunction with Tony and his team. And, you know, we, <laughs> we have these sessions which are really have been fun where we'll draw something and they'll draw something and we'll both react over the course of a session. And, and the project has evolved through this really iterative process, but the result to us is this thing that feels really cool, really real, really welcoming. And the same has been the case in the, in the neighborhood where you know, our objective all along has been, let's make a place that's interesting, welcoming, dynamic, uh, feels human scaled. And so, um, again, with other architects that, for me, I've known, but never really worked with, to be able to work collaboratively 
and have their ideas help shape the plan, you know, to be working on this community park design and be able to react to the architects on either side. So at any rate, that's kind of my, uh, my, my quick introduction. And I'm gonna turn it over to Tony to, to give you a really sort of kind of great introduction to the office campus and everything that's gone into it. Jaron will walk you through the hotel and the MCS and, um, and the town square. And then I'll come back and talk a little bit more about the mixed use residential buildings in particular. So, so Tony, I'll turn it over to you. Thank you so much, Aaron. My name is Tony Marchese. I'm design principal with Picard Chilton and our uh, responsibility was to uh, develop the design for the office campus. Um, and uh, I, I just want to start by thanking the chair, commissioners, and the public, as well as staff, for the opportunity to talk about the project with you tonight and share with you, uh, as Aaron alluded to, the the design of the vertical component of the office campus. And it it you probably got a good sense from Aaron that it has been a, a kind of an open collaborative process between the various architects and design teams. And although we we have our individual pieces that we're working on, we've definitely worked hard to uh, collaborate and and create a, a kind of cohesive vi a vision for uh, each of our pieces, as well as trying to make sure our piece contributes to the greater whole of the uh, Willow Village in a, in a positive fashion. And before we even picked up a pencil to begin to design, we did immerse ourselves in the general plan to get a better understanding of what your uh, vision is for uh, the city in general, but also uh, for this site and ideas about uh, creating equity within the community, creating good placemaking, emphasizing uh, density uh, between 101 and the Bay and encouraging businesses that uh, can survive uh, various cycles to us felt right in line with what we we're uh, endeavoring to create. And the principles also a, a bit more specifically talked about uh, access to public space, to open space, creating a safe and healthy living environment, uh, creating convenient transportation op options, addressing climate change and promoting green buildings and, and uh, a, a vibrant commercial core. And you'll, you'll see how we're starting to think about all of those uh, components. And then drilling down a little bit more in detail to the specifics of uh, the Menlo Park Municipal Code, we did very much look at uh, the a framework that you've created for building massing and scale, build to roof lines, the creation of a, a wonderful ground floor exterior. And the beauty of, of what you've created is it's not overly prescriptive. It allows for some uh, creativity on our part. And, uh, you know, as you get to be more familiar with the plan, you'll understand that we there are some adjustments built into it, but in all cases, those adjustments were done to create uh, variety and diversity and enhance the architecture in a positive way. And so I'd like to start with just a, a couple of plan diagrams to orient you and then get into some of the renderings, which will give you a much better sense of the look and feel and character of the architecture. So what you see here is the campus portion of the Willow Village highlighted. And you'll notice that it's six buildings with two parking garages arranged around a central green space. Uh, we have a circulation East Loop Road that anchors the eastern side. Those two garages contain transportation centers and are part of the overall vision for how the whole uh, campus is tied to the village and to the, uh, the general transportation network as well. One of the very first moves we looked at as we started to develop the master plan was building orientation. And the reason that's important is if we can limit the east-west facades, the, the extent of those east-west facades, we can dramatically reduce the ener energy consumption in the buildings. The other uh, net outcome of that is it did start to create a, a condition where the shorter ends of the buildings would front Main Street presenting a, a kind of a lower, more residential scale on the ends. It allowed openings or gaps within that street front to create uh, green spaces as well as 
porosity to allow views into the campus from the village itself. And really it, it gave us a way to kind of organize the building so that we weren't creating a, a kind of a continuous walled citadel, but something that was porous and open and whose edges were soft and, and, uh, and crenellated. But it also served a double purpose of allowing us to orient the buildings on, on sort of the ideal uh, solar orientation. In terms of the access, there are multiple entry points into the campus distributed throughout. And again, with the orientation of the buildings, the ability to kind of connect back to the village itself via a series of green spaces, view corridors, and circulation routes. And finally, an overlay of the transportation plan that shows Main Street, the route for trams, bike routes, bike routes along the East Loop Road, as well as loops around the perimeter of the campus to create uh, access to transit centers, as I mentioned earlier, within the parking garages themselves. And these transit hubs allow us to integrate bike parking, bike paths, shuttles, and trams to reduce the traffic that you've all spoken about us already. Uh, you know, the, the transportation plan and the team uh, has one of the most uh, successful uh, plans in the tech in industry, uh, which reduces by 50% uh, the, the transportation modes, dr dramatically reducing traffic, adding parking, bike parking, walking and carpooling uh, to reduce traffic as well. So a bit about how the buildings look and feel. I'm gonna to start to talk a little bit about the buildings on Main Street, take you inside the campus to see some of the spaces. We'll look at a garage and some of the storefronts on Main Street and then circle back to the town square. I think the first thing I hope you notice about the architecture is, as been mentioned earlier, uh, the campus buildings are all built out of heavy timber. And it was our main goal to build the buildings out of a sustainable, uh, healthy, uh, kind of human scale uh, structural system. But we wanted to make sure that the buildings expressed or that timber was visible on the outside. We didn't want to seal it off such that you didn't understand the, the construction and the, the warmth and texture of the wood and, and feel it from the outside. You also notice that there's a series of uh, sheltered overhangs and terraces distributed throughout the buildings. And then the buildings have a higher floor to floor on the first floor, transparent, open and welcoming. And the buildings are sort of bent or, or shifted to allow the space to open and, and welcome uh, folks into the campus. A view from the inside of one of those uh, kind of green spaces we call green fingers that connect uh, Main Street to the, the small plaza or pockets of green and then the green uh, courtyards within the campus itself. Again, this idea that it's transparent, open and visible, full of landscape, uh, terraces and open spaces. And again, the expressed timber that you see in the image. An image of the internal uh, circulation area at the center of the campus where we're adding a significant amount of trees. And again, expressing the timber within the buildings a series of terraces that allow folks to have access to the outside for fresh air and natural light. Just a bit about our sustainability goals. Uh, you heard Paul uh, speak earlier about the heavy timber and how it allows for a pretty significant reduction in CO2 as compared to a normal building. We're looking at 100% electric, uh, which aligns with the peninsula's clean energy reach code recommendations, over 27,000 uh, metric tons of CO2 have been avoided through the heavy timber. We're, we're planting 320 trees. Our goal is to have uh, lead gold um, and we're offsetting 20% of our energy demand through the, the uh, PV panels that are located on the rooftop of the office buildings as well as the rooftop of the garages. And just a kind of a deeper dive into the timber, you know, one of the beauties of it, as I mentioned earlier, is 
it, it gives one a sense of a connection to nature, uh, makes the buildings feel more humid, uh, evokes a sense of wellness, the ability to sequester carbon, uh, which reduces uh, the equivalent of uh, 69 million cars uh, within a year, uh, equivalent to the uh, 3,000 uh, uh, houses powered by uh, that amount of energy, as well as uh, uh, 36,000 uh, equivalent number of acres of forest sequestered by carbon. So a whole series of metrics that uh, demonstrate how the heavy timber and CLT decking is, is really a, a terrific way to build buildings and, and uh, really does make for some, some wonderful architecture as well as a, a great story relative to sustainability. Uh, a kind of a bird's eye view, axonometric view of the campus. And again, as Aaron mentioned, all along Main Street, we're planning the first level to be uh, active retail uses open to the public or entrances to the campus. So again, lining that Main Street with uh, retail uh, and the way that it's arranged is again, around a series of uh, open spaces that allow for kind of two-sided retail that fronts each one of those spaces, <clears throat> excuse me, which, which in our sense, in our view, will, will make Main Street active and, and uh, pedestrian friendly. Here's a view of that uh, Main Street retail. Again, open, transparent, visually acceptable, accessible. You see ideas about storefronts uh, that bring high quality materials, uh, a sense of openness and uh, a sense of, of activity along that pedestrian street. Just a detail shot, <clears throat> excuse me, that shows ideas relative to setting back the storefront, creating arcades, creating uh, a large amount of glass on the first floor, again, expressing the timber where we can and making a very rich uh, pedestrian environment. One of the views of, of one of those green plaza spaces that I mentioned occur between the two buildings, a chance to create a small kind of pocket of outdoor space, again, fronted on multiple sides by active retail use, an area for bike parking, an area for outdoor seating, rich planting, and again, rich materials. A view from one of those spaces looking back towards Main Street, just to give you a sense of the rich uh, texture and the kind of varied planting that's gonna occur in those spaces. And then a bit more about the design and massing of Main Street. In this diagram, you can see how we're setting back and creating facade, uh, oops, facade modulation. Sorry, it skipped. and really playing with the, the kind of planes and the depths of the facade. Again, to create a, a kind of a rich experience on Main Street, adds a, adds a, a sense of a human scale and adds some layering to the facades. And in a similar fashion to moving the facade planes in and out, we're also creating a series of, uh, of terraces at multiple levels so that the building massing and the roof line is varied along uh, Main Street multiple places for to have eyes on the street, multiple places to have activity at, at different levels and introduce some, some greenery along that main street as well. The same thing is happening on the East Loop Road where we're modulating the facade of the ends of the office building, as well as modulating the facade of the parking garages. A view from the south, uh, uh, east corner of the of the south parking garage, you can see that we're bringing the same attention to detail and materiality that we were bringing to the office buildings. Uh, a solar cornice uh, PV panel at the top, a clear delineation of the facade of the garage setting back at the top, providing a similar screen system that'll shield the cars, give the the. Uh, parking garages a look and feel 
that's quite similar to the office buildings, and then looking for ways to activate the street uh, at the base through some color and uh, perhaps artwork, et cetera. So all the, the parking garages are following the same rules relative to building massing. And finally, ending back at the town square with the, with the uh, office building and retail space that faces the town square. And you see how the, again, the building is sort of cascading and stepping down towards the town square, allowing for activity at multiple levels, uh, creating an open, transparent, uh, uh, visually active facade uh, on, on the town square, and then working uh, in concert with the other buildings on the town square, as well as the elements that provide the vertical circulation uh, to, to, the, uh, to the park. So hopefully that gives you a quick overview of the design, the texture, the look and feel of the office campus. And with that, I'd like to turn it over to Jaron. He'll walk you through the MCS. Thanks, Tony. Can everyone hear me? Yep. Yeah. Thank you. And greetings from Boston, where it's 1249 AM. <laughs> and uh, I hope to make some sense out of the words that will come out of my mouth right now um, in our sharing of the design uh, that we've worked so hard with this wonderful team. And so actually, we're really excited about being in this position to share these um, these, this design with you tonight. So I'm going to focus on the north side of the um, master plan. And um, I have the uh, kind of honor of sharing a lot of the public spaces um, uh, with you tonight. And so uh, as it's been um, highlighted several times on the north side of the master plan, the tail end or the kind of um, the north anchor of the mail of uh, Main Street is is the town square. The town square is surrounded on four sides by activity generating uses. On the west, we have a hotel. On the south, we have a retail pavilion. On the east is the retail and the office campus facilities that Tony just described. And on the north is this uh, one of a kind uh, public elevated park and the MCS, which is connected to the office uh, facilities. So I'll go through and talk about how we created these, um, these features uh, one by one. And one of the driving forces of the design elements that I'm gonna speak about is um, part of our philosophy of uh, kind of creating uh, wonderful spaces that highlight a sense of garden, uh, a kind of a blurring between interior and exterior space. Um, and what a wonderful place to work, but uh, in, in your community in, in Menlo and, um, in, and uh, taking advantage of the wonderful weather. So this is just a zoomed in slide of the, um, of the town square and the elevated park and, and all the components. And to start with the elevated park, it's a two acre um, public park. It's uh, an unbelievable uh, space with amazing planting and um, playgrounds and uh, paths for bicyclists and for runners. It's a quarter mile long from end to end from um, east to west. And um, it, it plays a very, very important role from our perspective in creating a safe and friendly way to cross uh, Willow Road. Um, and uh, uh, so I'll show you how that works. But once you get on top, there's all these wonderful amenities that are um, for the community and for uh, small gatherings and, and uh, uh, events and festivals and programming and anything that we can dream of um, as the park uh, becomes uh, uh, built and used by the community and, and, and um, so the, the way you get up to the park is very dramatic. It's 30 feet in the air and uh, it's connected by these five positions, which are kind of like these beacons. Um, there's stairs as Paul Nieto uh, described and also a series of uh, large uh, elevators, um, large enough to take bicycles up and down and uh, to connect up to the park. And so once you're up there, 30 feet in the air, you have, um, an amazing overlook uh, to the north, 
to the baylands and to the wetlands and to the south for sure over the town square and all the um, uh, great amenities of Willow Village that are being built. And so just as a kind of point of reference, um, the walking dimension, let's say, to cross is probably between, actually, I would say about eight minutes to walk from end to end from, from uh, west to east across, this, uh, depending how fast you walk, I guess. And we've collected um, with the team a series of kind of these imagined possibilities of programming and um, use anything from, um, and, and it's kind of a very passive place. Um, it's going to be meditative and it's going to be a, a real community space uh, for gatherings and public events and fairs, uh, like I mentioned. We think seasonally that this, this park will also change character. And um, I'll, I'll, I have a couple renderings of, of kind of different imagined events that can be positioned on the park that I'll share in a moment. But first, we'll zoom in on the west side of uh, Willow Road and the connection that allows people to safely and securely get up to the park and cross Willow um, over the traffic. And we're thinking that these, um, these, uh, these positions, that these elevator uh, positions are also opportunities for public art pieces. And so they could be adorned with um, really wonderful graphics. And um, so uh, they become kind of markers of like, this is the way to, to get from one, it's going to be very clearly identifiable um, uh, circulation for everyone to see. And once you're on the park, you know, we've, we've imagined the space with indigenous planning, planting, wonderful sculptures and uh, public art pieces, uh, seating spaces, walking trails, uh, shady spaces above. Um, and we were thinking about the types of programming that you could put there, like um, art classes in the garden and you know, seasonal events, little festivals and uh, weekend parties, um, the kinds of um, you know, everyday events that you can imagine on the weekend. But also maybe um, we were trying to imagine some kind of festive events, like we were imagining what it might be like and a Halloween party uh, for the community to, to come to the elevated park. Uh, we can imagine uh, small spots to go play chess or you know, go uh, meet your friends and, and within this like really amazing um, garden environment. And uh, you know, we, were, we were thinking maybe there's guided tours, there's tremendous bird watching opportunities from the overlooks and, and the views to the, uh, to the baylands are kind of unbelievable, um, spectacular um, overlook spaces and opportunities. So um, back down to the uh, town square, um, like I mentioned, the, the, on the south side of the town square is this uh, south retail pavilion, which is a kind of small, a quaint uh, retail um, volume. And like Paul said, um, all the spaces around the town square, we worked really hard to kind of enhance with planting and kind of furthering this, what I was talking about, these kind of principles of, of, of garden and making it feel lush and, and kind of comfortable and human scaled. And so, you know, aside from the massing being the right scale and the right height and the right proportion related to all the other retail spaces around, stepping down to the town square, we're also doing a lot with the landscape to give it the right feeling, the right character, um, everything down to the, you know, studying the right size paver. And from the, um, looking at the retail pavilion from the town square side, it's designed to completely open up. So it truly is an interior exterior space. And we imagine all the activities um, of kind of dining and, and kind of retail spilling out um, to this plaza space uh, underneath the trees and, and creating a really, really friendly environment. And the plaza itself is like this blank canvas to um, really um, have fun with. And, we were imagining movies in the square and, and farmers markets and art shows and performances and music and 
all kinds of fun things. On the west side of the square, you're looking here, I'll just highlight while I have the slide open, um, the hotel, which is unique in the way that we've actually masked it and um, kind of stepped it down towards the square. And we, were, we thought a lot about how we should relate this um, hotel to the, to the, the public space. And actually the hotel itself is, is um, a garden hotel at the center of which is this enormous uh, courtyard with trees and, and, and flanking it um, uh, restaurants and activities. So you can enter in there and feel it's very inviting. And there's this wonderful, um, it, it feels like the hotel and, and its amenities are also serving the community and out to the town square, which is, we think, a really nice uh, gesture. And on the Willow Village um, corner, now looking into Willow Village and towards the grocery store, it creates a, a nice framing of the uh, of the arrival into into Willow Village. And on the far left, you can see here the elevated park as the crossover um, Willow Road. Um, the meeting and collaboration space you've heard it referred to as the MCS in the previous um, kind of documents and master plan um, drawings. This is an expansion of the Willow Village campus and part of the Willow Village campus, which Tony just described. The axis of the, um, the, the office spaces um, is anchored on the north side by this building, which is an all season um, uh, space for um, Meta to use. And um, it's, uh, we're really kind of excited about this building. We wanted to create an all season space where you could be inside the building and see the sky and you can feel like you're outside, but uh, they, so, but also that Meta could have events there um, on rainy days and on days that maybe the weather is not so good. Um, we didn't want to condition the space um, in the traditional sense. So when we visited the site for the first time, we were very aware of the prevailing winds from the north. And so what we did is we designed this enclosure over the um, meaning and collaboration space as uh, with global sustainability experts that we gathered. Um, and so what happens is we have these operable panels that open on the north and they welcome the prevailing winds in and it literally flushes the warm air up and out of the enclosure so that um, it actually uh, moderates the heat gain and it's it's kind of um, at the kind of highest of uh, performance uh, characteristics when it comes to sustainability and uh, building design. And so as you see the silhouette of the MCS from now we're kind of seated at the retail pavilion on the south side of the town square, you can also see that we have a public entry into the building. And so from the town square, we animate the north side of um, the space uh, with uh, what will be the public entry and in, in, into the building. And this is a real unprecedented opportunity for us. And we're really excited to be part of this um, kind of um, uh, project where, where we've actually assembled this um, array of experiences um, where a meta is, uh, uh, where let's say the community and meta are truly connecting. And uh, we think that that's really exciting. We're, we're um, super happy with the output here and we hope you um, see the value of the design work we've all put so much hard work into. So thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, do we have anyone else speaking for the applicant now? Yes. Yeah, so um, I will wrap it up here by kind of walking through the last component, which is the mixed use buildings. And um, <laughs> I want to thank you all for your patience here. You know, it seems like a 59 acre master plan isn't all that big. And then you get into every nook and cranny and you realize this is a really uh, hardworking plan with a lot of, with a lot of nooks and crannies. And so anyways, it's, it's uh, I, it's both su super um, complex and, and yet I think in some ways um, kind of fundamental, right? You take a series of buildings, you focus on the spaces in between, and you, and you develop a handful of rules that everybody applies. And, um, 
so just to focus uh, a little bit on the mixed use building. So um, uh, undoubtedly, as you as you get these architectural control packages in front of you, you'll notice that we've we've numbered them sort of one through seven. Uh, one being the hotel, two, three, four, five, six, seven being the residential mixed use buildings. And um, I wanted to focus on these buildings and really kind of highlight a handful of things um, in particular. So I'm, I'm, I'm of course talking on behalf of a handful of architects um, and trying to summarize. Um, you know, a, a lot of time and energy, but also, again, it's sort of a series of fundamentals around building design. So, you know, I think each team took a, um, a thoughtful approach to parcel configuration, right? These aren't just going out to the edges and extruding up. It's how do you think about a given parcel to make the spaces around the building on and off the parcel more interesting. Um, building massing, Right, so so parcel two, as you'll as you'll see, is a single building split into two that preserves visual connection of Center Street through, even when Caltrans really wouldn't wasn't interested in a full intersection. Um, and so, how do you how do you break down these buildings into very human scaled and understandable pieces? And then um, building articulation. Right, those those are not big monolithic things. How do we introduce the sort of scale and rhythm? at each stage of the facade um, and the ground plane to make this really, again, the kind of interesting and varied experience. Um, so I thought I'd put together just a, a simple little diagram to kind of talk about this give and take that we've had as a team, um, because I think you do start to appreciate how it interrelates. So um, Jaren, the last image Jaren shared was of, of uh, this office building on the east side of town square sort of stepping down. So these dark blue lines sort of suggest the taller piece, the light blue lines as it steps down an elevated park and the hotel. And so there's, there's this sort of graduated scale to each of these buildings. Um, as you go down Main Street, you can see that parcel three um, doesn't follow the road as the road bends out and around. It steps back to create these pedestrian scale, you know, plazas and, and little parklets. Um, and it was, you know, Tony mentioned that the short ends of the office buildings go to Main Street, um, where there's sort of an interplay where, where parcel three sort of pokes out. There's a gap between the two office buildings where, where, where the office building kind of meets the street. Parcel three pulls back, you know, sort of you get this ping pong of, of little plazas and parklets culminating in the dog park at the south end of Main Street. Um, you know, in a similar way, uh, these residential buildings that relate to the community park in the southwest corner, courtyards open up to the park, visual connection, the massing steps back. So again, there's been this choreography in three dimensions. And I think having had, having had the benefit of sort of looking around the 3D model so many times, you, you get these really fascinating public spaces that I think will reveal itself through the architecture. There's a there's an intersection here between East Center and Main Street where it, you know, you, you'll be in this and see these just wonderful views of these buildings that um, I think are the result of a lot of careful planning. Um, but just to sort of focus on a few of the kind of key elements of the architecture of the mixed use, um, you know, walking down, Main Street, for instance. So this is that view you've seen, no doubt, right? Willow Road coming across the grocery store um, on the north end of Parcel 2. Big, clear, visible retail uh, proportion of building that really kind of gives prominence to the retail. The residential can step back. Every one of these buildings has a base, a middle, and a top. And yet each building does it a little bit differently to create variety. Um, you know, again, you could, you could certainly um, come to the ex, you know, the, the edge of the site and extrude up to the maximum building height, but that certainly wasn't the intent, right? By by folding this U-shaped courtyard back, you get short ends of the block on Willow Road that starts to break down the mass scene and starts to be much more varied and interesting. Again, just sort of enriching the experience of being here, driving past, walking through. Um, a little bit this interplay of how retail and the mixed use buildings kind of co coexist. That grocery store that I just showed you a view from that Northwest corner, um, 
in large part, just because of raising the site, like Paul mentioned, you know, it really, the front door of the grocery store is within the project. Obviously you can drive in really easily and get into the parking garage, but this primary corner facing town square really becomes sort of the anchor of Main Street. And then it um, comes around and down south and these yellow areas become outdoor, light yellow areas become outdoor dining. So again, using the building to create public space and this choreography between building design and master planning, which has been so fun for all of us. Um, and so, you know, here, here's that main street corner of the grocery store, this big deep arcade that creates, you know, a very sort of weatherproof place to come in and out of the store and that active, you know, accessible frontage on the, on Main Street, the town square. Parcel three, uh, we start to see the scale of a person, this really generous height retail, um, you know, and often a kind of short-sightedness of these mixed-use buildings is that the retail isn't given enough prominence. So we've got, you know, a really generous floor-to-floor -floor height here to, to just give the retail that visibility, that prominence, and to really kind of control what the eye can see. You know, we're all just accustomed to that 20, 25 feet uh, of the bottom part of the building being so important to us. I spent the weekend in San Francisco and you just, again, the, the best buildings from a retail perspective are the ones that do the best job with that best, you know, that lower 20 to 25 feet. And you can see how uh, the choreography of the, of the, the massing and the proportion to the building really sort of lend themselves to that human scale and then they step back as they go up higher. And so here Main Street bends to the left, but the plaza is really sort of opened up because the building doesn't follow the street. Here's a view of where that building pulls back. You get this really unique, uh, memorable, I th we're thinking it wants to be a, whether it's a restaurant or a bar, some kind of food and beverage outlet um, out on the corner and then the walkway will pull back. Um, this will likely be the entrance to a entertainment venue or food. And so this becomes, these little plazas just become these really interesting spaces. And, and, and so critical to the design of this retail experience is that we've got that just sort of generous floor to floor. Um, as I mentioned, the, the park is such a form giver to the architecture the um, we did a series of community meetings and got a lot of feedback on the park and so this is in its um, I guess this is probably the first time we've shown this plan um, in a public meeting that is still as Paul mentioned uh, being developed but it's pretty exciting all the ingredients as a gathering place for the community and it's you know really significant in scale and so parcel two parcel four parcel six you know, they sort of pay deference to the park with the way they open up, the massing steps back, you're, you're just the eyes and the visibility, the, the visual connections, but then also the physical connections. So, you know, this is parcel two on the north side of the park. It has this great glassy amenity space, lobby space on the corner, quick crosswalk over and you're in the park. But then, um, each of these residential units on the lower floors has a stoop that really addresses and sees the park. And so, you know, each of these stoops, and I've got, a, I've got an enlargement in a minute, um, is, is a human connection from a really generous sidewalk to a planting area, to a stoop, into someone's living room. Um, Mr. Ashley, I'm sorry to interrupt. Um, sure. We do have to keep an eye on the clock. Um, we yeah, I've got about three minutes eye. left, if, if that's good for you, Chair. Yeah, we have to stop by 11 unless we take a vote to continue and we are going to have another round of public comments. I, I will be very fast with the rest of the slide, sure. Um, so I'll just, I, I wanted to use this slide and, and um, uh, I think I can, I can wrap up pretty quickly after this to just highlight that in employing, you know, all of these approaches to human scale and connectivity and massing adjustments, there's a handful of adjustments to the code that you know we, we've we've looked for and, and I, I know we're highlighted in the staff report, and they really become an interpretation. Um, you know, balconies are very thematic in a human scale project, and um, uh, you know, projected balconies 
for us, as well as recessed balconies offer that kind of variety and modulation that is so key to places. You know, being able to step big massing elements back, um, which we, we think is a benefit, but, but sometimes uh, isn't always, you know, consistently rewarded or acknowledged in the code in terms of how modulation is treated. So anyway, we wanted to just start the conversation tonight with, we think there's a ton of richness in these plans. And um, I think a lot of opportunity to, to bring really interesting elements so that there's so much variety from building to building, all of which is really in the spirit of what Connect Menlo was striving for. So, you know, I'll just close quick, quickly, Chair, by saying, I think at each turn, the idea here is to introduce, you know, a real livability to this place, right, between the stoops and the gardens and the over, you know, the, the wide sidewalks, and to make sure that um, this really does have the chance to be, you know, a super interesting, livable place um, but it's done, you know, in, in large part at the scale of a person on the bottom 20, 20 feet, whether it's a, a stoop or an arcade, whether the balcony is projected or recessed. I think each of these is an opportunity to really enrich this place. So I'll just leave it at that. And, and I'll say at the start, um, I wouldn't have thought this was, you know, this is my favorite rendering. It's, it's standing in front of a building Tony's been designing looking at spaces that Jaron's been working on next to a building that I've been working on with a connective landscape. And, and you don't see the evidence of any individual architect. It's just really been a kind of a cool collaboration on how do you create really attractive public space and buildings. So I'll stop there. Thank you. Um, I do wanna open it up to public comment in a minute. Um, if the commission has clarifying questions, we. We can take those, but I'd prefer to get to public comment and then take uh, commission questions after that. Not seeing anything urgent. So, um, Mr. Pruder, uh, do we have hands raised now? Thank you, Chair Doran. Yes, we do at this time. Um, I see five currently, um, so I could begin with that if you'd like. Yeah, I, I do want to stay with the two minute time limit per speaker because we need to have some time for the commission as well. So yeah, let's uh, let's go. Okay, that number has grown slightly. Uh, so as a reminder, please press the hand icon if you'd like to comment, uh, members of the public or press star nine. If you're calling by phone, I will start with Brittany Baxter. Um, Brittany, I'm going to allow you to speak at this time. And if you could again, provide your name and jurisdiction, and uh, you'll have two minutes to speak. Thank you very much. Hello again. Thank you, Brittany Baxter, District 3 resident. The project looks absolutely beautiful. I know I commented earlier on the EIR portion, so I'll just kind of share a couple general comments now as well. Um, I think it's really fantastic how the team has worked with the immediate neighbors in Bellhaven to think about requests, you know, alterations to this development, given that, especially like was mentioned earlier, Bellhaven really has stepped up and, you know, grown at rates above and beyond the rest of the Menlo Park these last several years. So really love how this has turned out. Um, at least from my perspective. So earlier I had asked about ways to reduce car traffic and glad that that came up again as we think about reducing vehicle miles traveled and greenhouse gases and you know anything we can do there to connect um, the parts of Menlo a little bit better, you know, I guess pun intended given the, the project name um, would be fantastic as well, you know, so that people can move between District 3 and downtown um, and over to this development as well. Um, and then in my earlier comment, I also asked about the um, kind of the alternative option within the EIR to add 200 additional units to the project. Um, and so my understanding is EIR is not really focused on the affordability of those units, just kind of whether or not they exist. I might be wrong, but um, here I just wanted to also comment in support of making those 200 units um, as affordable as they can be, again, to just really help to slow you know, displacement um, and gentrification within this community as well. Um, given the scale of this project, right, it is massive, like we've just seen, I think 59 acres. So it really feels like a great opportunity to make the most out of this opportunity. And I think that's about it. Thank you so much. Thank you for your comment. Our next commenter is Karen Grove. Karen, uh, again, we'll uh, allow you to speak. If you could please uh, repeat your name in your jurisdiction, uh, you now have two minutes to speak. Thank you. Thank you. Again, I'm Karen Grove and I'm on the Housing Commission, but I'm speaking for myself. And my comments are gonna be about the below market rate 
um, aspects of the proposal. Um, one thing is I think that uh, we feel strongly that the, I feel strongly and, um, and I'm also speaking a little bit for Menlo together, that the inclusionary homes in the market rate units should be a range of affordabilities that reach as low as is feasible, which I would say is very low income for a mixed use or for a market rate project. So very low, low and moderate. Um, and given that this is a meta funded project, I think that the it would be wonderful if meta would increase their investment into our community to achieve equal numbers of very low, low and moderate income affordable units. Um, additionally, I, I wanna be sure that this goes to the housing commission. I think it would be enough material for a study session to talk about the BMR agreements. Um, I'm glad to see that the staff is open to exploring changing the 75% cap on moderate income rents, but that is a very useful um, provision in our BMR guidelines. So I would be very careful about lifting that. Um, and then for the 100% affordable units, I love that we're doing that. I love the proposal to partner with a nonprofit housing developer to build and operate those homes. I see that the minimum level of income is 50% of area median income. No, I think it was a little lower, um, 25%. Um, I think that that is too high for someone on a social security income. And so if we really wanna meet the needs of our most vulnerable seniors, we need to go lower than that. Um, so I, I hope that that is all still to be determined. Um, and I, well, I'm out of time, but thank you. Thank you for your comment. Our next commenter is Adina Levin. Adina, again, I will be allowing you to unmute yourself. If you could please uh, repeat your name and jurisdiction at the start of your comment. You now have two minutes to speak. Thank you. Um, good evening, uh, planning commissioners and staff and uh, developer and architecture team. Um, Azina Levin, Menlo Park resident, and um, wanted to, uh, first of all, um, there's a lot of discussion just uh, now about the, the architecture, but I wanted to talk about the functions of the place and in particular really uh, commend um, a, a Meta and the project team for bringing forward the uh, grocery store and um, services and the housing to earlier phases of the project. Um, that was something that uh, uh, nearby residents and the community had been um, really uh, eagerly looking forward to as um, you know, part of the benefit to the community um, of the uh, Connect Menlo uh, plan. And it is good to see that this, um, uh, the, the, the proposal is bringing those things um, forward in time to be able to uh, be a benefit to the community sooner. Um, also, um, the, uh, the uh, uh, mass timber construction um, uh, does look cool in addition to having environmental benefits and uh, wanted to uh, be supportive of the various different environmental features from the solar panels to the recycled water and the rest of the focus on environmental sustainability and um, uh, also the a uh, good thought given to the places for people to gather and people to spend time so that it's not just a set of buildings, but a set of, of buildings that is the focus for people to uh, interact with other people and a place for communities. Thank you. Thank you for your comment. Our next commenter is an account by the name of pixel number four XL. I'm going to allow you to speak. If you could please provide your full name and your jurisdiction uh, at the beginning of your uh, comment. You now have two minutes to speak. Thank you. Maybe we could that this, yes, yes, sure. The next person uh, on my list here is someone by the name of Jay Rodriguez. Um, 
we're going to allow you to mute yourself if you could please provide your name and jurisdiction at the start of your comment and uh, you'll have two minutes to speak thank you all right can you hear me yes we can okay uh good evening chair Duran and commissioners uh thank you for the opportunity to speak tonight my name is James Rodriguez and I'm a journeyman carpenter with Local 217 living and working here in the San Mateo County. Uh, I'm here tonight to voice my support of the Willow Village project. I started my carpenter career over 10 years ago as an apprentice and learned my trade through state certified classroom learning, as well as on the job training. Now as a journeyman, my career has given me the opportunity to continue to live and work here in the Bay Area while comfortably taking care of and providing for my family. Without a livable wage and good health benefits, this would never have been an attainable goal. Too often, developers request to come into our communities to build and undoubtedly turn a decent profit without being committed to upholding standards of providing livable wages, healthcare, and apprenticeship training opportunities to their workers. Without these standards, it becomes almost impossible for workers to continue to live in the communities they themselves are building. With this developer's commitment to using a union signatory general contractor on this project comes a guarantee that these labor standards will be adhered to leading to all workers being treated fairly and being paid what they deserve for their hard work, not to mention the inevitable side effect of a quality project being built safely and timely. It's for these reasons I put my support behind this project and ask that you do the same. Thank you again for the opportunity to speak. Thank you for your comment. Our next commenter is uh, Harry Bims. Again, uh, thank you for your comment. Uh, I will uh, allow you to speak again and unmute yourself. If you could please repeat your name and jurisdiction as you begin your comment, uh, you now have two minutes to speak as well. Uh, hello, my name is uh, Harry Bims. I'm a District 1 resident and a former two-term planning commissioner. So I just have five points to make real briefly. A uh, Willow Village is not hard to get to for District 1. Uh, we can walk to it for retail versus driving across the freeway and train tracks. Uh, the way to think about it is that Willow Village Retail represents a neighborhood downtown for District 1, and it's not large enough to service the entire city. Even the park was designed to prevent its use as a sports field to maximize its use by District 1 residents. And concerning the VMT issue, um, consider that work policies to allow work from home are having a far bigger impact on VMT than adding more housing units or updating the roadway. I think we should also take into account how internet connectivity to the project site supports flexible work patterns as a way to reduce VMT. I'd like to reinforce an earlier point that District 1 has already absorbed hundreds of affordable housing units that should have been built in other districts in Menlo Park as required by law. Even today, other districts continue to enjoy credits for housing they never built because they were actually built in District 1. We really need the other districts to refocus their demands for more affordable housing to other neighborhoods and not to this project. Uh, indeed, what we need are suggestions to upgrade Bell Haven. For example, District 1 has significant roadway needs to underground power lines, plant trees, et cetera. We should start there if we want to look for infrastructure benefits for the project. The redevelopment agency plan for Hamilton Avenue is a perfect blueprint to consider. In fact, comparing Newbridge to Hamilton Avenue only gives you a partial idea of the kind of impact an infrastructure plan for the neighborhood could have for removing blight. In short, this project as is far exceeds any project in Menlo Park by a wide margin, and in my view, should be approved. Thank you. Thank you for your comment. Our next commenter is Pam Jones. Uh, if you could please uh, repeat your name and jurisdiction at the start of your comment. You will now have two minutes to speak and you may unmute yourself. Thank you. Thank you. And um, Pamela Jones, again, resident of the, excuse me, Bill Haven neighborhood in Menlo Park. And I don't know if I mentioned this before, but I remember in 2017 when this project was first introduced to the city council, and it was actually kind of late in the meeting. And I, I said specifically that I support a future city. And I was just fascinated by the concept. So, and I've watched this project over the years and seen it um, morph from one thing to another, always trying to satisfy the concerns of the Bellhaven neighborhood. And I do appreciate that Signature has actually bent over backwards trying to negotiate this with, with Meta because I under, understand it was not Signature, it was Meta that was making the final decisions. Um, with that being said, 
to be consistent, um, there should be um, at least 20% uh, that are below market and affordable, and that should be based on living in Menlo Park, not on the county statistics, because Menlo Park is very ex um, expensive. Um, it also should have a formula which allows displaced people in the area to have access to the apartments first. Um, and in addition to that, a percentage of the BMRs, affordables, and market rate apartments should be for home ownership. This would strengthen the community there and ensure that we would have um, sufficient people for the retail and the grocery for the future. Thank you. Thank you for your comment. Um, uh, Chair Doran, just uh, to clarify, there's one last commenter I have, and this is the person who was able to speak earlier, so I will try again, if that is okay. Yes. Okay, thank you. Uh, again, this is the commenter with the account name of Pixel4XL. Uh, I'm going to allow you to mute yourself and if you could please state your full name and your jurisdiction at the beginning of your comment. You will have two minutes to speak uh, once you begin speaking. Thank you. I'm not uh, seeming to be able to allow for their yep. uh, audio to unmute. So if you'd like, uh, you're welcome to close the comment period. We don't see any other hands raised this time. Okay, uh, I will close uh, public comment. So, and bring it back to the commission uh, for comments and questions. Um, I actually would like to lead off with a question for the applicant. Um, there's been a great deal of focus on uh, traffic and circulation within the development and connections to Bellhaven, uh, all of which are, are, are great, they're commendable. Um, but people are not going to come from the East Bay uh, on bicycles or, or walking. So I would like to hear more about the transportation management plan for longer distance transport, uh, you know, how you're gonna mitigate the effects on Dumbarton Bridge on 101 and on uh, Bayshore um, and get people in there to the office space uh, without taxing the, uh, you know, the, the road system what it needs to be. Uh, Chair Dorn, uh, Eric Morley with Signature Development. Can you hear me? Oh, great. Yeah, yes. thank you. Uh, thank you, um, and yeah, thank you for your question. Um, yeah, you know, we've looked obviously very carefully at not only the site but uh, but the surrounding uh, you know area. Um, I think um, kind of getting back to an earlier question, both about TDM and parking. I think you know we're fortunate that Meta has one of the most, if not the most, aggressive transportation demand management programs of any tech company in the country. Uh, you know, more than 50% of its workers are uh, coming to work with alternative modes of transportation. So, you know, off the bat, we're, we're able to be very aggressive in terms of parking reductions, uh, in terms of TDM and, and traffic management. So that, that will continue. Uh, the TIA uh, and to transportation impact analysis and uh, EIR uh, also looked at, uh, you know, other roadways and intersections. The project will fund um, significant uh, traffic impact fees uh, that will go to specified uh, improvements uh, throughout uh, Menlo Park uh, and throughout the area. And then we are continuing to evaluate uh, the EIR uh, and those mitigation measures uh, that are you know, related to the project. As I think Paul may have mentioned, you know, today, you know, um, getting people, you know, um, through Willow Road, uh, in various areas, there is only one entrance to, to the site. So uh, the site becomes far more porous, uh, it becomes more accessible uh, with four uh, entrances. So you're going to see today where there's only one entrance at Hamilton, uh, you know, a natural uh, you know, dispersion of traffic as well. Um, I think we're obviously committed to uh, looking at uh, both, you know, Meta's um, 
TDM program, continuing to, to grow that. We also have a trip cap uh, and as you know, have reduced our employee capacity for the project by 30%. So not just um, the employee, uh, not just the trip cap, but the actual you know, number of employees. So I think uh, those across the board, plus some of the recommendations that are within the EAR and TIA will be looking at that are not just affecting the site, but also surroundings. And then lastly, the uh, significant improvements to Willow Road, both bike, pedestrian, uh, complete streets, uh, uh, enhancements to, uh, to Willow Road. What about uh, TDM for the res residents of all the apartments being built? Um, you know, they're not all going to work at, uh, at Meta. Um, so what are you doing to mitigate that demand? Yeah, what I'd like to do is have um, uh, either Paul Nieto or Eric Harrison on our team if the, um, if the moderator could, if they'll raise, see if they'll raise their hand, if Eric or Paul is available. They can talk to the uh, TDM measures. The, the EIR also uh, calls out uh, various measures. And I'm just looking for my domain expert. Uh, let me see if Paul or Eric are available. Looks like Eric's got his hand raised. Well, good evening, Chair and Planning Commissioners. Eric Harrison, Signature Development. What we've uh, developed, I'll make this brief given uh, the hour, for the residential component and the, re the retail and the hotel, we're proposing a transportation demand management association. So we'll have a professional organization managing the TDM so that it provides the maximum benefit without having to involve directly the property owners. And its sole purpose will be to reduce uh, trips, provide alternative measures, and provide uh, information and data for the residents, employees, and guests at the hotel of other options other than single occupant vehicles. As you, I, as you probably are aware, we have a mitigation measure on the residential side to have a much, uh, to increase or decrease the uh, BMT so that we have no greater than slightly over 6,000 average daily trips. And the party responsible to make certain that happens would be our transportation demand management program, which we think, and I've been involved with in other jurisdictions, have been highly effective. Thank you, Eric. Thanks. Uh, I'm going to yield to my fellow commissioners uh, who would like to ask questions or comment now. Vice Chair DeCarty, you're in the upper left, but I don't see a hand raise. Uh, Commissioner Harris. You're on mute. Sorry, thank you. It's getting late. I'm in the Midwest right now. Um, thank you so much for the presentation. Uh, the architects, um, the architectural team, it's a beautiful project. Um, all the articulations and the the attention to human scale, um, all the attention paid to the environmental sustainable buildings and infrastructure is terrific to see. Um, of course, I would also like to go back to the reminder that the cars are the one are the thing that's really contributing the most to environmental concerns. So um, I am definitely in support of any TDM management that can um, help us. Um, and I also, even though it wasn't part of EIR, I am very concerned about the parking. Um, we're currently scheduled to be, for all intents and purposes, at the maximum currently allowed in Menlo Park for this project of 6,500 spaces. And incidentally, that's the same size as the new Disneyland parking lot. So to me, I'm just a little concerned that we're that we're moving in the wrong direction. And I know Meta has been a leader in TDM and would like to see what they can do here with this project. I know another, a lot of other companies have followed their lead. Um, and I am sure that there can be some more ideas, maybe opening up the Meta shuttles to outside workers if they work in, uh, if they work in Willow Village or even for some of the residents in there. So I'd like to see us think a little bit outside the box on what, what can be the next level of TDM? Um, 
Then I have a couple of comments about the housing and um, BMR. I'm excited for the 1,730 much needed housing units um, to go along with the office space and, and acknowledge the reduction in office space since the last time. Um, but to be clear, this still shows a net decrease in housing availability with within the region of 815 units. Now I realize Menlo Park is not gonna absorb, have, has never absorbed all of the housing. In fact, I guess we're only at about 5.9% for those who work in the city, but I think we need to come a little closer um, in helping out our local residents and not further displacing them. Um, if we're looking for a 20% additional over that 5.9 or 7.4, which is Facebook, then we still are at a net loss for the low and very low income levels of about 140 units. So I know that's really what I'd like to see. And I know we've been talking about this 200 extra units um, in total, but I think if we could make at least a good portion of those, 140 would get us back to bright on both the low and the very low income um, levels. I'm, I understand that there's an interest of eliminating the 75% cap on moderate income rents, but this could end up resulting in units renting out at a market rate. So I don't, I don't feel comfortable. I don't, I don't see that um, for this right now. Um, additionally, per, per many of the callers, and I really agree, it would, if we can figure out a way with the city or, um, <clears throat> who the manager is to allow first rights to current as well as those recently displaced residents from the Bellhaven neighborhood. So I just wonder um, if that's something that could work and how that might work. I'm not really sure who I should ask of this question. I don't know if that's staff or someone from so through the chair, I can I can sure. provide a, a a high level answer because I, I am not our housing expert in the community development department, but I, I do know that our BMR guidelines or the ordinance, and they are different, do include language regarding um, uh, preferences for recently displaced. Um, I, I think the year starts in two thousand seven or two thousand nine. Um, kind of as part of that economic recession. And so I, we do have some connection to that in our guidelines. I have to follow up separately with more details. I don't have all those in front of me right now, but, but I do know we do have a, a program or, or components of our BMR program that, that do look at um, uh, recently displaced or, or displaced um, residents of Menlo Park as a preference. Thank you. I think it'd be great if we could just take another look and make sure that we're doing all we can to support um, the groups that have really um, taken the brunt of most of the housing and displacement in the Bellhaven area. And I'd like to see what we can do there. Um, there was just a study I'm sure that some people saw that just came out from Stanford this week that more than 2,600 students in the school districts throughout San Mateo County are experiencing housing instability over the past three year period. And that 58% of those students are coming from the Ravenswood City School District schools. So I think it would be great if we can um, work towards making sure that those kids are housed um, so that they can do well in school like the rest of the Menlo Park community. Um, the last thing I just wanted to talk about is the retail. I'm super happy to see a full-size grocery store as part of this project. Um, for too long, the neighborhood of Bellhaven has been really lacking this basic amenity of both grocery store and pharmacy. And so to see this project deliver, that's really terrific. And I'd like to thank Meta and Signature for moving that grocery store into phase one. Um, my only next question, and I guess this is of signature, is um, as I was preparing for this meeting, I was trying to look at what population is required to sustain a full-size grocery store, and I found numbers that were all over the place, but given that the population of Bellhaven is around 5,000, I mean, of course, residents from nearby Eastern Menlo, East, Menlo, East Palo Alto would also 
utilize the grocery store. I'm a little concerned about the long-term viability of a full-size grocery store. And I'm just wondering what analysis that you've done and have you reached out to, um, have you reached out to grocery, um, potential grocery brands and who might be coming in? Um, so I'm wondering if somebody from Signature could just talk a little bit about the the viability of the grocery store and uh, who might be coming in and what some of the other retailers would be as well. Sure, um, Commissioner, thank you. Good, great question. We're equally excited about uh, the, the full service grocery store. Um, you know, we've spent you know, an exorbitant amount of time uh, with uh, a, a number of grocers. I think the, the good news is there is significant uh, interest um, and uh, we uh, won't be in a position uh, to execute a lease until we have uh, a project approved. Uh, but the good news is, is uh, there is significant interest um, uh, and you know the variety of grocers that are would be considered you know full service. That's a 37,000 square foot grocery yep. store. Um, but I think we, we're all familiar with those names. So we're, we're very excited about the level of interest. Getting to your question, um, and I can have Mike uh, Gilmetti, uh, president of Signature, um, join if the um, moderator um, would uh, enable, he can talk more specifically about um, the grocers. But with the uh, Bellhaven population, with the population uh, within Willow Village, worker population and surrounding neighborhoods, uh, there is significant and, and more than ample uh, demand. And, and that's why there is significant interest by grocers to being here. So I think the good news is, um, you know, uh, if we build it, they will come. So that's that's good news. And I'll, okay. I'll defer to Mike. I don't, um, I don't need, I think oh. that that feels oh. pretty good to me. So yeah. I, I don't know if we, I know that I'm gonna, I'm sure the chair is looking at me like, hurry up. So yeah, understood. I'm gonna <laughs> got it. I, so, but I just wanted to be responsive. Yeah, understood. Thank you. Um, I just one thing that I would like to think through is I just would really encourage the Facebook employees who are working at Willow Village to frequent both the grocery store and the other retail amenities. And I'm concerned that when Meta um, Office is supplying all the dining and other services, I'm just very concerned that perhaps it's going to become as much as you want this to not be insular it could end up becoming insular. And we really need to make sure that we're engaging more with those local businesses. And, and, and I, I would like to really see the Facebook employees mixing and utilizing the grocery store and the other retail. And I'll just share with you, we've been in very uh, good discussions with Menlo Park local retailers about uh, coming to Willow Village um, and we'll continue that dynamic kind of authentic authentic mix that that we at, at signature uh, kind of continue in each of the the communities so yeah thank you very much and understood okay actually one sorry one last architectural question i am loving the timber i think it looks really beautiful and i'm just wondering what is the long term um, maintenance required for this? How is it going to look in 5, 10, 20 years? And I guess I would have the same question about the elevated um, uh, walkway. Yeah, I'll cover the uh, elevated park and then I'll turn it back to uh, Tony uh, if he is available. In terms of the elevated park, um, that park and the uh, and the, the office, you know, those are all, uh, all of the maintenance of that. Those are uh, privately owned, privately maintained, but fully, you know, publicly accessible in terms of the, you know, elevated park. So, um, you know, that uh, is something that will be uh, maintained by Meta. And then I'll turn over to Tony in terms of um, the longer term, uh, you know, uh, operation and maintenance of the, the mass timber. Tony. That's a, it's a terrific question. It's something that we're definitely looking at and have experience in. And, uh, very briefly, uh, number one, we're going to cover the top of the timber exposed beams uh, with flashing. Number two, we're going to pick a species that weathers well and does well on the outside. And number three, those members will be uh, treated with uh, uh, a sealer on the outside to help uh, uh, prevent excessive weathering. That's not to say that it will have to be 
uh, kept up and maintained as we go forward. But but uh, that's all part of the facade maintenance plan that we're taking into account. Okay, thank you very much. Thanks, that's all I have. Thank you. Uh, Commissioner Riggs. Yeah, thank you. Um, I'll just make a, a quick note that uh, you can't directly flash wooden beams, but I'm sure the architecture team knows that uh, when it gets down to the details. Um, uh, I'd like to, again, thank my fellow commissioners for raising, I think, uh, some important points that need to be kept on the desk um, and, uh, and uh, will require follow through. And that goes for elements of transportation, elements of architecture, and um, as Ms. Harris noted, the viability of the retail components in the village. Um, uh, on that issue, um, I suspect Mr. Parada is aware. Um, Kyle, I trust you're still here, even though I can't see your name on the screen at the moment, <clears throat> that Palo Alto had a similar requirement for a grocery store. It must have been 15 years ago uh, at uh, uh, approximately at the 101 Embarcadero exit. And I don't remember if it's called the Evergreen neighborhood or, or what it is. And that, that store kept failing. And eventually Palo Alto became so frustrated um, that uh, they went to court and it was an extended and very difficult and very painful experience over many, many years. Um, uh, and there are reasons why it was almost unresolvable. Um, and I certainly agree that if um, the historic uh, Facebook services to their employees continue that um, retail will simply not have the success that um, um, is enjoyed by, for example, in uh, San Jose, Santana Row, where there's a combination of residential and office uh, that does a great job of keeping the retail steady and allows the um, out-of-towners such as myself to come down and find a vibrant community and a successful retail environment. Um, so I can only um, um, wish, uh, wish good luck to the team. Um, regarding discussions on the um, TDM V and trip cap as uh, monitoring devices. We do know that, well, history tells us that the Bayfront Expressway has been at capacity in every parking lot, um, to my knowledge, um, since it's been occupied by high tech. And when I say at capacity, I mean, it, it appeared that virtually um, drivers had to be employed to keep cars running around the parking lots because there were no more parking spaces. Um, so the idea of reducing employee count is um, sort of management by paperwork. Um, the test will be ultimately just how many employees are needed and how many employees will come into the buildings. And um, it will not be controlled by good intentions. It will only be controlled by um, uh, effective alternatives. And right now the alternatives don't really exist. Um, Facebook has done more than a commendable job at 50% diversion. Uh, I'm not aware of uh, any major company that approaches that. That being said, however, their alternatives are limited. There is no public transportation, meaningful, useful, dependable, and speedy public transportation to where the housing is. And the housing's only 15 minutes away, but not at commute hour. 
um, this can be addressed over the Dunbarton Rail Corridor. And again, credit to Facebook who put a lot of effort into trying to make that a viable corridor. Um, there were issues at the time, the largest one being the possibility of major funding. Um, I would like to think that in this environment right now where infrastructure is the federal government's, I was going to say largest, it, it's what they present as their largest um, intention for economic recovery um, with dollar numbers that California has never seen before. Um, that public transportation will take a whole new turn. And I think that will support projects like Willow Village. So um, I'm going to say just at this hearing that uh, I am hopeful. Um, I did want to, and, and, and please, uh, to the architects, uh, accept my asking the question just because I think it should be asked, not because I don't think you haven't already discussed it probably in depth, but there are two issues in Menlo Park that uh, require real thought um, on a new campus or actually any new building. They are sun exposure and wind exposure. Um, Facebook and Frank Gehry found out um, in, in ways that uh, architects and developers have found out in other cities in the past rather repeatedly that when the wind blows, uh, the environment is just not the same. Um, and we do have a prevailing wind. I saw the prevailing wind, I believe, indicated on uh, one of the site plans. Um, I would just like to encourage the team to make sure that those areas that we want to be outdoor seating areas are effectively um, screened from the all too persistent winds on, under certain conditions. And then the sun, um, people simply don't go out and sit in the bright sun anytime from May through October. Uh, you bake, you can't, you can't make it through the 40 minutes of your lunch hour that you have outside. Again, I think these are being addressed, but I just wanted to make sure something was said. Um, so um, I have, uh, one other uh, comment I think I'll just make, and if it's possible uh, to bring up attachment S, and, and specifically, I believe it's page S2. I don't know if um, uh, Mr. Prada, you're, you're able to do that or um, whoever has the button at the moment. Um, and maybe while that's being brought up, I'll go to another issue. Um, I'm just going to suggest that, uh, well, I think it's an absolutely wonderful idea to plan events, uh, both on the elevated park and in the um, uh, created um, plaza spaces throughout uh, the site plan. And an excellent example of this, albeit on a small scale, is 240 is 250 University, which is also accessed from Ramona. Um, it's a project that includes Chase Bank and a number of small retails, but they it created a courtyard in the back. And when um, music appears in that courtyard, so do 50, 100 people, um, it's magic. And so I think we can maybe look forward to that. Um, and then some overall project uh, comments. Um, uh, I have to say, even though it's already been said tonight, the sustainability um, behind this design is just so impressive. Um, and it's just really great to see a project that, and especially on this scale, that has this level of quality of design, proposed materials, and long-term thinking. Um, 
And then the meeting and collaboration space is just so cool. I think that will be a part of what makes the, yes, that's the sheet, thank you. That's part of uh, what will make that elevated uh, successful. It just happens I was on the High Line, um, well, just a week ago today. And it's certainly different in that it has uh, the population of lower Manhattan as opposed to um, the population of a um, uh, 59 acre tent tech campus. Um, but the experience has so inspired the neighboring uh, property owners that I suspect there have been more creative buildings built adjacent to the High Line in New York than in the entire rest of the city in the last 10 years. Um, so this is going to be a lot of fun. Um, I, I do want to just ask if, particularly since this building did not show up in the uh, I, if this is still a design that is uh, part of your consideration, because I, I couldn't help but note it, it really sticks out in that it is, does not appear to be the level of the other designs um, from the many and several architects. Um, so through the chair, if I could just ask Signature if, uh, if this is a former design that uh, was still in the, uh, in the plan. Before we do that, we're going to need to uh, take a vote on extending. It's, a, it's 11 o'clock. Um, I would like to see a motion to extend the meeting to 1120, if I could get a motion on that. So moved. We have a second. Uh, Vice Chair DeCarty seconds. So I'm going to call the roll. Commissioner Barnes. Yes. Thank you. Commissioner Harris. Yes. Uh, I think Commissioner Kennedy has checked out. Uh, Commissioner Riggs. Yes. Commissioner Tate. Yes. I'll vote yes as well. So uh, it carries with six in favor and one absence. Um, if the um, applicant would care to respond to uh, Mr. Riggs question, we can continue. Yes, uh, Chair, um, uh, thank you. Um, and to uh, respond to uh, Commissioner Riggs, uh, S2 is part of the current uh, architectural package uh, and have noted, uh, noted your, your comment uh, here as well uh, and provide obviously any initial comments uh, or additional as needed and uh, thank you. All right. Well, I'll leave it at, at that comment then. Um, uh, that I, I I don't think it's uh, at the level of the other buildings. Um, uh, and, and I I don't really want to say more uh, other than that. Um, um, and uh, then I'll I'll just say that, that there are two issues that really challenge this project. And not solely this project by any means, uh, any large project uh, in Menlo Park. And one issue, and this applies to any project in the Bay Area, is um, water. Um, the Bay Area is not like Nevada which owns, I think, a one third share of the Hoover Dam and has more water than they know what to do with. And they, I think they sell it to California and Arizona. We, on the other hand, are facing about as extreme a drought, long-term drought as we've had. We will be in our homes, cutting back on the use of water Farms this year have already been ordered to cut back on their use of water. We don't expect to have a miracle and um, be clear of this misfortune, uh, say, by next October. 
Um, and, and frankly, water is a problem for growth. Housing is a problem for growth. Traffic is a problem for growth. Growth is a problem. Um, but uh, a lot of us feel that this project, Willow Village, has so many benefits to uh, the city and particularly to the north end of our city um, that we would really like to see it go forward. Very much appreciate that uh, recycling is, is being considered. We cannot get around the fact though that we're gonna have a net increase of several thousand workers in the daytime and several thousand residents. Um, and then the other project, traffic, again, you simply cannot add thousands of workers and thousands of residents and not have a traffic impact. And while we have been somewhat on pause for two, three years, um, our neighbors, at least, I believe seven of our neighbors on the peninsula have similar size projects um, that are either in planning or have already received planning approval. Now, all we have to do is remember what traffic was like in 2019, and it's probably three quarters back at this point. It's going to be pretty much 100% back very soon. And that's nothing compared to what's going to happen as these seven, now eight, huge projects, nearly all of them on the east side of 101 with no contact with our sole existing true transit system, Caltrain, when these come online. This is all going to be roadway access. Even if we all have, even if they all have 50% diversion, which is very unlikely, we'll still have tens of thousands of new commuters and new residents. Um, I wouldn't want to fast forward six or eight years from now and have any hope of driving anywhere during the first half of the morning or the second half of the afternoon. Um, and yet we need to. Um, unfortunately, the peninsula requires that we use automobiles. And an awful lot of us have to take a very varied uh, route during our day to complete our tasks and our work. So probably the one possibility to keep at least Menlo Park and Redwood City environments um, uh, functioning in terms of transportation um, would be the possibility of a uh, train across the Dunbarton corridor. So again, I'm going to hope very much that this moves forward. In fact, I am personally going to work as hard as I can to see that that does work move forward. And I will close with one more statement of thanks to Meta, who have done as much as anyone uh, to try to improve transportation in the South Bay. Um, and um, I hope we'll continue to do so. That's my comments. Thank you. Uh, Commissioner Barnes, you're up next. Thank you, Chair. Thank you to the applicant and the applicant team, all of you for for presenting this evening and to the consultants um, for the EIR piece of it. Um, as an overall impression, I mean, I couldn't help but being struck throughout the presentation at the, just the, the ex extraordinary use of materials and design that went into uh, each individual aspect of, of, of the buildings. I mean, this is, this is really what you get when um, you have an owner user for whom economics really are secondary to building out and placemaking. I mean, this is what you get with 50 acres when it's done 
uh, in a way that is almost like putting really good architects into a room and saying, think of what you can in the best way that you can. And I'm just amazed at uh, what has been brought forward. Uh, in, in our purview as the planning commission in terms of um, what we have oversight on is in fact an architectural control piece. And I think you're off to a wonderful start there. I have a question, a couple questions for the applicant team, just some clarifying questions uh, through the chair. When the, the market was shown, there was a reference in the presentation, uh, I believe that the market had been at a certain uh, height and then uh, the, the topography of the, the site seemed to go upward through compaction or otherwise to uh, create somewhat of a rolling hill. And I don't know if it was east or west, I don't know my orientation right, but I wanted to understand a little bit about what is there some grading that's being done to the site um, that raises it in, uh, in places and for instance, and uh, you know, next to the, uh, to the market, for instance, which gives you a slightly higher uh, enrolling uh, grade from the market going up. So if I could ask the applicant team that through the chair. Uh, yes, thank you, uh, Commissioner Barnes. I will uh, ask Eric Harrison if he uh, is available uh, on our team. Uh, to, and, uh, and while we're waiting for Eric uh, to, oh, there's Eric. Uh, Eric can cover that question for you. Um, Eric, go ahead. Sure, thank you, uh, Commissioner Barnes. What we're doing twofold is one is we're elevating the site by bringing it, by grading it to get it out of the flood hazard zone. So today in the approximate location of where the grocery store is proposed, the current grade's about eight and a half. And we're gonna raise that site to a minimum elevation so that uh, all of our buildings have a minimum finish floor of 13. So it's about five, five and a half feet. And what happens, and you, what you may have picked up from one of the renderings, is where the grocery store is located on parcel two, on the frontage of what we're calling Main Street, there's a grade differential from existing Willow Road at the intersection, at the new intersection of Hamilton and Willow Road as it ramps up. So you're seeing the, the grade go from eight and a half up to about 13 on that segment in front of block two. That's the grade differential there as we have to elevate that site at a reasonable rate that still meets uh, the minimum requirements for ADA access on the sidewalk, et cetera. And to clarify for Commissioner Barnes, there's a transition of about five feet that is picked up um, for ADA uh, through, that, through the site. Thank you. Um, also related to, to this topic, did I hear that you were going to go below grade for some parking? Yes, uh, we have, uh, we originally included an above grade structure that would serve the retail and town square. And in response to community feedback to add additional open space, grow town square, we're, we're actually locating parking below town square uh, and, uh, and, and further extending that. So yes, we will have directly accessible uh, uh, below grade parking that will serve uh, town square and, and some of the retail. To the best of my knowledge, there is not another project in the M2 in the Bayfront that has gone below grade. Um, how does that work from a dewatering perspective? How, I mean, you're, you're basically digging in the water effectively at that, at that elevation. What's the, what challenges does that uh, create present? What's, what's, well, where can we find ourselves in trouble on something like that? Yeah, well, a great, great question. And, and fortunately, um, you know, that condition is, is, is very, um, Common, um, you know, throughout the Bay Area, um, so um, those are um, pretty typical and standard uh, engineering activities in terms of creating 
uh, uh, parking, you know, structures below, you know, below grade. And fortunately, Eric Harrison on our team, you know, can provide you a little more detail. But from a, you know, engineering, uh, construction development perspective, it's it's very common, very straightforward. But Eric, I'll defer to you just to provide a little more detail. You're on mute, Eric. There we go. Sorry, I don't think there's much more to add other than. The, the Meta construction team has a significant amount of experience with the dewatering when they were building a portion of the Bayfront expansion campus. So they have that experience. We have a very experienced team that we've assembled that of construction managers and uh, geotechnical engineers that have already studied that. And we're certain that there aren't any issues given the team we put together and Meta's experience on their recent uh, completion of the Bayfront expansion campus. And thank you. And just to clarify, I mean, of course, people are going subterranean and sub T on parking. Uh, I don't know who's doing it that close to the water. Um, and that was the genesis of the question. And being literally at the water uh, and knowing that we, when the Connect Menlo plan was developed, there was a lot of, of work on that, for instance, the five foot um, elevation that went into it. And, you know, the reason why you have to put it up five is just for that reason. Be, um, obviously, that's, that's um, it's for sea level rise, which is slightly different, which is different from elevation. But knowing that you're that close to the water, um, what you're saying is, it could be anywhere, but it doesn't matter whether you're in a different location or this location, your processes for, for going subterranean on, on, the, on the parking aren't, aren't impacted by the site prep, the site location that you have. It, exactly. And a great example would be, uh, you know, the Adobe buildings in, in downtown San Jose, very far away from the bay, but a very shallow uh, water table. And so, you know, they've constructed three uh, you know, buildings um, in that area um, at, in, in very similar condition given the, the, the water level. Okay. Um, and as it relates to the, uh, the residential portion and taking the any BMR units aside for the units that are not designated uh, as BMR units, will the ability to lease those apartments be open to anyone or will there be any set aside of preference for uh, med employees? Yeah, again, uh, thank you. A uh, very good question. Yeah, these are planned to be available to the public. Um, so um, they are available to the public. Thank you. And then last question is, do you have a sense of the overall would you be willing to share what your sense is now of the overall construction cost of the project? Like how much, what's the scale we're talking about to get this thing built? And of course, escalations and costs and so forth. But in, you know, 2022, 2023 dollars, what's the general number that you're thinking that it's going to take to, to build this thing? Yeah, you know, um, Obviously, tonight, you know, we're focused on, you know, architecture and uh, design and, and really aren't uh, prepared tonight to discuss the construction costing and are, are still estimating that. So not not prepared to uh, provide that that feedback this evening. Thank you. Thank you for that. I will yield uh, back to the uh, chair. Thank you for your input. Thank you. Uh, well, it's 1117 and clearly we're not going to finish by 1120. I've got an early call in the morning, so I am going to have to check out. I'm going to hand my gavel over to Vice Chair DeCarty and uh, you guys can uh, decide how to proceed. Good night, everybody. Chair Doran, thank you for your service. Chair, Chair Doran, thank you so much my for pleasure. your time as chair. It's yes. been great work with you guys. You thank as well. You. Take Bye. good care. Thanks. More than thank, more than thank you, Michael. You, since the day two years ago, you had to take over for me during my absence. You have done an excellent job. Uh, uh, something that will be the standard in the future. <laughs> thank you.
Thank you. Short meetings. <laughs> Good luck on that. <laughs> Good night. Fabulous. Uh, we have to end in two minutes unless we vote to continue. Um, I have uh, at most 90 seconds of comments. Um, Commissioner Tate, do you have an estimate um, so we can figure out how long to request on this? Um, mine's short. Uh, so could I get a motion to extend to 1130 and I will promise to get us out earlier than that if at all possible? Yeah. I move. All right. All right. From Commissioner Harris, I see a second. Uh, Commissioner Ray. I'll second. Uh, Commissioner Barnes, yay or nay? Oh, I'm sorry. Uh, yes. Commissioner Harris. Yes. Commissioner Riggs. Yes. Commissioner Tate. Yes. I'll vote yes. So we're 11:30 um, or sooner, and I will turn it over to Commissioner Tate for your questions and feedback. Okay. Um, I think that overall it is a nice looking project and um, and I do think that a lot of thought went into it and appreciate that. Um, I am uh, of course concerned about the housing and especially the mix of BMR and um, and the and the, the sustainability of the retail, um, especially the restaurants. And I'm just wondering um, if something can be put in place similar to, um, and I know this is a meta question, uh, similar to Mountain View and um, how they uh, uh, have agreements uh, to not serve food on campus so that the uh, businesses around can, can survive uh, there on San Antonio. So I'm hoping um, that that is something that can be considered uh, to make sure, uh, you know, for the employees that are housed uh, within this building, um, to make sure that uh, the build that the companies are, um, uh, I'm getting tired, you all, are um, definitely making money and able to survive. Um, and I would like to see, of course, um, uh, ultra local um, uh, businesses go in um, as opposed to, uh, so more like kind of mom and pop that are able to do it, of course. Um, <clears throat> and then go back to, to um, the road also, because I am really concerned about um, the moving around and the burden that this is going to put um, on Willow Road and being a Bellhaven resident, um, I experience it firsthand. And it would be great to study putting in a road to go directly out to Bayfront. Um, aside from that, I think the project is, is nice. Um, I like the layout, I like the park. Um, it, it definitely is a nice project. Thank you. Thank you, Commissioner Tate. I just wanted to put a pin in a couple of things that uh, fellow commissioners have said really, really well uh, in their comments. Um, I think first of all, um, with Commissioner Barnes and his point about architectural control being our main uh, point of view, uh, purview here, um, I completely agree that you are well on your way. Um, I think the materials, the layout, the design, the care, the passion that the, the team presented this evening is all fabulous. Um, and I think completely headed in the right direction. Um, and so to the extent that there are sort of variances about what uh, parameters you're asking to operate under, it seems to me that um, those are, um, were well um, explained about why you wanted to utilize them and how well they will look. Um, and I, I think that goes sort of across everything that will end up doing with um, all aspects of uh, the underlying um, agreements, um, uh, zoning, et cetera, that needs to happen with the project. Um, for me, I think it's really important uh, on BMR. You've gotten feedback all over the place. And I just think you've been great. And the project is large enough that there is going to be some significant affordable housing, especially for seniors. That's fabulous. I think we can also do better because we have to do better. Uh, if you look at our housing element, you look what's in front of us for the next eight years as a city, and you look at the places where that's gonna happen, I think you all can continue to play a role to lead and to do more. And I think you've got some parameters to make that happen and look forward to it. Um, on the parking question, 
completely agree with Commissioner Harris. Um, we've had a big conversation about parking. You're asking for it to be at the upper end, 6,000 plus, um, when it could be lower at 5,900. I think that's really just the beginning of it. I think there's radical ways to ask to reduce parking. And I think that ultimately is the ticket to solving a whole lot of problems. It costs you a bunch of money to put parking in place. We could put that into lower cost housing. And ultimately the only way that you're gonna get cars not traveling to this place is to not let them park there. Uh, and that puts the incentive structure in the right way to be able to actually ramp up TDM and the ways to further incentivize folks to car share, to um, find alternatives uh, that we need to have happen. Um, and that then relates to um, my last comment here, which builds on the really nice point that Commissioner Riggs made, which is, I think this project is fantastic in mostly how it looks into itself. Um, and a comment from Ms. Levin in one of the um, earlier sessions said, said this really nicely. But I think there's still so much to think about and how it connects back to the rest of the community. The east side of this project is a massive barrier. It's a wall that no person in the public can get through unless they get up to Bayfront or they get down and around the bottom end of it. Um, and that east side is really unfortunate. And that's predominantly because of parking in this. So that's just one example. Um, but the bigger thing is that this project and what the traffic comes to it is only a part of everything that's gonna happen in this community. It's gonna go down through all of the projects that are before us at the life sciences that goes across the bridge and is gonna be what happens with the redevelopment around Middlefield and USGS that goes into SRI, which is even a larger property and ultimately what our town has to do downtown. So Willow Road is gonna get crushed. So as a planning commission, we see these as one-offs and our entire town sees these as one-offs, but they are all happening right now. And each of you, Meta being in the lead, and as Commissioner Riggs said, has done a fabulous job in putting together an infrastructure to get people out of their cars. You run buses, you've got carts and, and trams and, bikes and scooters on, on the property. But Tarleton has a private bus service and SRI is talking about putting in a private bus service. How many private bus services that are not connected to each other do we need here? So I'm not sure we actually don't have the solution. I think there's actually the resources that is already happening here, but is completely disconnected in a way that doesn't function for the only person that matters, which is the person who's got to make a decision to use some other form of transportation than their car. And so I really put it to you all to press your leadership that you've shown, again, as Commissioner Riggs said, with the massive reduction in single occupancy vehicles and coming to the Meta campus, and now lean into the rest of our community as you've done in support of the community center. And let's solve this connectivity problem within our community. Let's solve it between downtown and the Bayfront and the community center past the high school and then ultimately down to the junior high. And let's find a way that we can actually get that so that people will get out of their cars. That is the only way that we're gonna break this cycle of congestion and misery that is gonna be immediately outside of this fabulous community that you are building, unless you play a leadership role with the rest of us to make that happen. I think that's the most critical thing that I wanted to add to what were great comments from the rest of our commissioners. So let me pause there and see if there's any final comments or questions from fellow commissioners. I want to give an opportunity, uh, first of all, just on behalf of all of us to just go back and thank the applicants, the presentation tonight, the staff for the incredible preparation and work on all of this. And I want to thank the 31 um, community members who are still with us as attendees and have stuck here for five and a half hours and for your commitment to pay attention and to give your feedback to this project as it goes forward. Um, and with that, I will close this item on our agenda and I I'm either, I think I'm gonna turn it to Mr. Prada if there's anything to close for the evening here uh, before, we, before we wrap up. Uh, yes, thank you, uh, Vice Chair Dicardi. Um, just really briefly, we do, just from a staff um, announcement, um, next meeting will be a special meeting next week, uh, May 2nd. 
Uh, it, it's a public hearing and a study session for the draft EIR, um, draft EIR public hearing, excuse me, and study session for the 1350 Adams Court Willow, uh, project adjacent to this, the Willow Village project on, on to the, the Eastern edge. Um, so stay tuned for that. Um, and that concludes my reports and announcements. Any commissioner questions of Mr. Prada this evening? All right, with that, I will gavel us closed at 11.28 and give you two more glorious minutes of sleep, everybody, this evening. Thanks again for being here, everybody, and for the time. Have a good evening and tomorrow. Thank you. Thanks, everyone. Thank good you. Night.